Welcome everybody, we are now live. Uh, so the strategy and planning committee is now open uh, and underway. Okay, so um, first of all, we do have some apologies. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. We have um, Lynn Carter as an apology, and I think that's it. Everyone else is here. Um, we know that for you if you want. Second. Uh, sure, Mr. Allison, yes, he's mm -hmm. there. Sorry, I'm just giving up to date here. Yeah, I think we've got everyone. So just a mover of um, Councillor Hope, second to Councillor Wilson for Lynn Carter. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against, carried. Thank you. I'll just note that we do have a number of sicknesses today. Um, some of the <coughs> writers, uh, for example, Warren Hanley, um, Anita is also sick, hoping to join us for some of the meeting, if not all. Anyone else? Uh, no, not that I can think of, but we also potentially have um, some of our councillors too and also our CE who um, have joined us uh, through the strength of character, I think, but perhaps may need to leave during the meeting as well, and we understand that. So we're just going to, um, we have got all the papers here and we're going to proceed. <coughs> And um, yeah, just do as best we can today. Thanks everyone for being here. So we can, can oh, we do not, do not have a public forum. We can confirm the agenda unless anyone knows anything different than me. Second. Yep. Second, the, what are you doing, Kate? Second. I, I thought you were moving out second. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> moving the confirmation of the agenda. Seconding that, Councillor Wilson, all in favour? Aye. Right. Against, carried. Reminder on conflicts of interest as usual. Uh, we have the minutes there from the 13th of April. Uh, so we can consider those as true and accurate or not. Somebody yep. here to move those. Councillor Hope seconded. I can second that. <coughs> All in favour? <coughs> Against carried. We do have a couple of open actions. Um, which are here in front of me. One on the Targa Lake strategic plan. Uh, so, oh, previously that was going to tender. I don't know if we need a scope review expected to be underway by the end of financial year with probable completion by September. So that was an update we had previously. So let us question. Yes, and there was one on Otago Active Faults as well, which is in progress. Um, what is that? Provide a report to the relevant council committee on recommended option for implementation plan developed in collaboration with TAs for incorporating a tiered approach into planning frameworks in terms of Active Faults. It's in preparation, but past that date. Okay, Councillor Scott. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, we've had a recent approach by Don Robinson in relation to the Central Otago Lakes, and it's, it's potentially separate to the Otago Lakes strategic plan, but maybe there's an overlap. So my question is, are we liaising with that group prior to going out to tender? <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure if there's someone here who does know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. Gretchen, I might be able to help. Oh, Anita, thanks. Yeah, that, that tender went out before we got the letter from, um, from Don. Um, so it, it didn't shape the first stage, but we're certainly aware of it now and we'll make sure that we don't you know, double up as we move forward. But that, yeah, we'd already done that first piece of work before we got that letter. Okay, so I've misread this. It's got actually got the date of the fourth, Robert. Yeah. Okay, well, as long as that liaison happens. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. My understanding, and Anita might be able to confirm this, is that LAMPRO have been contracted to assess the issues and report to Council. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And when do you expect that report back? Uh, it's, yeah, it's not actually my piece of work, um, so I'm not sure, but I did see the, 
um, the tenders come in. I, I, I couldn't tell you. Amanda might be able to if she's. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. sorry, we've, um, yeah, we're making dough in terms of who we've got oh, here can, today. Can you follow that up, Anita, for us, please? Just Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. I'll find out for you. That's right. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, everyone, for the <coughs> questions on those. We'll move on from that. Um, actions and on to our first paper then, which is joint future development strategy with Dunedin City Council. Oh, excuse me. Today we have Lisa Hawkins, um, I understand, as the um, lead staff member reporting to us, and um, you'll give a quick overview of what we're um, doing today. Thank you. Kia ora all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of the paper and then just take you through each of the recommendations. Um, Do you want to turn your mic on? Sorry. sorry. Yep, that's better. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, apologies okay. for that. Um, so you may remember it was about six weeks ago we did do a um, joint workshop with DCC on our responsibilities with them to prepare a future development strategy. So this paper is effectively off the back of that workshop where um, we, the DCC team and ORC team and Mana Whenua um, presented, I guess, the, the structure um, for, for undertaking the work, um, as well as I kind of identify some of the key issues that we thought from each organisation this work would need to, need to pick up. Um, so we've prepared this paper um, to bring back to you to get your endorsement, I guess, on the process going forward. Um, and basically the similar paper, the same paper went to DCC's Planning and Environment Committee last week, um, and we understand that they um, endorsed the recommendations of, of that report. So this, I guess, is a, is a process for you now to consider um, <coughs> recommendations before you. Um, <coughs> as we know, we have, we have the joint responsibility to prepare the FDS with our um, TAs, relevant TAs. So for us, that's DCC and QLDC. So the next paper will take care of the QLDC um, process. Um, so our first recommendation, just to take you through those at the moment, is um, to endorse the recommendation that DCC are the lead coordinator for this piece of work. Um, and what effectively that means is um, DCC, given the fact that they've got um, extensive urban experience in their team, um, hold a lot of background knowledge um, around their capacity and their future planning um, for urban growth, um, that they will basically, I guess, undertake the responsibility around organising meetings, marshalling resources, um, kind of working with the project team, which I'll take you through in a minute, in terms of um, designing the workshops that we bring to, um, to both councils. So it's, I guess, a reflection of, of their skill set and also their capabilities in terms of resourcing to, to take on that lead role. Doesn't necessarily mean that they lead the content. That's obviously um, something that is jointly prepared between the two councils and Mana Whenua as well, importantly, as a key partner in this work too. Um, so the second uh, recommendation is to endorse <clears throat> the workshop approach. Um, so as I've just mentioned, what that means is a joint workshop approach um, where we bring together our planning and strategy committee and DCC's planning and environment committee um, at key points of the process to test ideas, to get feedback, um, to develop the program um, that we use a joint um, committee workshop structure for that um, and that at this stage too those committee workshops are proposed to be publicly excluded um, to basically I guess allow um, councils from both councils to, to consider and talk freely um, amongst the decisions that are being put on the table. Um, importantly too the reason why I guess we have considered that that's the appropriate level to bring together the two councils is because both of the, um, those committees also have Mana Whenua representation on, so it's important for us that we also have my panel involvement in this piece of work too. Um, and then the, the fourth um, uh, recommendation there is to endorse the interim government arrangements. Um, so that process I've just mentioned there basically forms the basis of the governance arrangement and just acknowledging um, that there's obviously um, elections later this year. We're proposing to kick this off as an interim <coughs> arrangement and then to come back and revisit it should there be any changes to committee structures um, and things like that once um, new councils have been elected. And then the final um, recommendation there is just to note the project management arrangements um, in this report are in the um, for, to endure the, the process of preparing the FTS and the project management arrangements that we, we are referring to there is the structure of staff internally. So we have a project management um, 
team, a joint project management team that has <coughs> staff at officer level on that's, I guess, the, the doing and the working of the, um, the FDS, and then they report up to a joint executive steering group which has general manager and chief executive um, representation on there. So we're proposing that that structure of how we work would endure the whole the lifetime of the work for the FDS. Um, so that's, I guess, just taking you through the background of this report. Um, we obviously need to prepare the FDS um, in time for it to be considered and to influence um, as it needs to the next LTP. Um, so we are, are on a relatively tight program schedule um, for both this and the Queenstown Lakes Future Development Strategy. Um, other than that, I guess the book paper can be taken as read and happy to take any questions or clarifications. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we had a briefing yesterday on the um, Queenstown Future Development Strategy as well, and it's interesting to compare the two um, approaches, but yeah, great to have this before us today to be able to um, make a decision on as well. I'm opening it up now. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to need lots of questions or whether we're better to move into the recommendations fairly smartly and debate. So if there are any questions, now's your chance to ask them. Councillor Malcolm, then Councillor Scott. Uh, so, so the future development strategy, um, with Free Waters now the owner and operator of the water assets, uh, and that, I know that's not quite right yet, but they will be very soon, uh, should that should that group not be part of this discussion? Um, through you, uh, Madam Chair, the the I guess the the way we've structured um, this process is that there will be key stakeholders that we're going to need to be engaging with, and the water services entities I guess would fall into to that process, as would uh, Waka Kotahi, Kaiama Aura, um, and they would be I guess brought into the discussion at key um, influence points and key decision making points I guess around infrastructure going forward. Uh, Councillor Scott. Yep. Just, we, we've lost our two urban specialists. Is that a problem? Um, yes, from a resourcing perspective, um, we're pretty light on in the RPS um, Air Coast and Urban team at the moment. We are trying to recruit for those positions though. Um, so hopefully we will be able to fill them and um, then we'll have dedicated resources to work quite closely with both, both DCC and QDC. At the moment, it's me that's um, doing that work with QDC and DCC, so I'm providing that overview for IRC. Uh, it's further complicated by, um, unfortunately, Lisa's leaving us as well. So um, in very short order, we're going to be down to, to none in that RPS team. So yes, it is a problem, um, and potentially a bigger problem than Lisa's realising because she's carrying all of that work at the moment. <laughs> no, it's, it's, good, it's, good, it's good to have the reality of that. And, um, yeah, no, it's great. Thank you, Council Laws. Um, so this is really an interim step, is it, this governance procedure until yes, until the election, and then we will re-examine this in the start of the new term. Yes. Yes. That's not just personnel, but it's also policy as well. Uh, and, and I guess, and potentially structure of committee yeah. structures. It's just um, the work program, as I said, because we're working to quite a tight time frame. We need to get going and need to have something set up mm -hmm. that we that enables us to do the work with DCC. So that's why it's interim at the moment. And who's oversighting us from a government point of view on this? Is this the Ministry for the Environment, Ministry of Who? It's, the, it's come out of the MPS for Urban Development, which is under the Ministry for Environment. Um, but there is obviously, there's key stakeholders like Koma or the Ministry for Housing and Urban Development that are also involved in that um, MPS as well. Are they providing you with assistance and advice? I'm thinking to myself, gosh, we might talk about pressures of staff and exigencies upon us, but everything seems to be referred back to MOE as well. Are you finding that uh, A, that they are providing you with the staff, sorry, the advice you need at the time that you need? Or have they got issues of resources at their end? I'm not aware at this point in time that we've actually had to go back to um, to central government for any seeking any clarification because we're at the start of the process. Um, I guess on reflection, which we'll get to this paper next, the QRDC process does have some of those key players already at the table, um, and and that process through Grow Well Fire is finding that they are getting the you know the support and that the answers. Um, 
and involvement when needed. So hopefully if we need to, to get that assistance from MFE, we'll be able to, but at this stage, we haven't had to approach them. Thank you. Councillor Calva. I'd like to move these resolutions with the additional one I've just forwarded around. Which Di has, and she might put up for us. In addition to four? It's yeah, just a, work. another one. I mean, yes, it is a counter to it. No, it is just another one, isn't it? I think it's a five. I think it's a six because it refers to three and four. So Di's just getting there up, but I can read out what you've proposed. What you're proposing there, Hillary? You've sent that as email. That council refers that ESG members, which is short for Executive Steering Group. Executive Steering Group. Yep. And the public, non-public nature of the proposed workshops and any ancillary matters to the any ancillary matters to the incoming council to discuss who and how we move forward. We could probably refine that. Yes, but feel, bit. feel free to <clears throat> shamelessly interfere with that, but I think its idea is there. It should be number five, just because it makes better flow between three and four. Sorry, guy. That out there? Mm. Well, except, Except that this is a suggested change to the project management arrangements, which will endure throughout the preparation. Yeah, I'll take it. Whatever. I'll take out six. It's, it's sixes. Yes. Is it membership or membership? Membership, it can be. I would have just put, put, I would, I would just would have put and refers after the word elections. Mm. That's what you're trying to do, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, I, I think six is irrelevant anyway, because it can be, be changed at any stage. Yes, it can be part of four and then leaving five out completely would be fine by me. I'm happy to second that. If you haven't got a second. No, we haven't got a second yet. So we've got a mover and a second for that. One question. Yeah. So should it be the ECG membership? That's what um, yes, Brian suggested, and I'm happy for it to be membership. I'm <clears throat> oh, sorry, Brian. I'll just cross your reading up down here again. You want that membership? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. That's we're removing five completely. The point is really that if this is just to last till the election, we haven't got in it something that continues after the election. So what I'm, si I'm signalling that it should turn up on the agenda of an incoming council to look at these things. In the second last line, the word we should change to they. But that's okay. Thanks. Or it. Or we, yeah, it, how it, yeah. Yeah. It's not giving them direction, it's just giving them taking, chance. taking away five because they might. What we've sort of done is. Okay, you, yeah, would you like to speak to yeah. this then, perhaps, yeah. um, Councillor Calvert, explain what you were yeah. wanting to propose there? Okay, in why I will. Um, the point is that it's obviously a short term, some of it's a short term thing, some of it's a long term thing, but it, because we need something that happens after this, it will keep going till we get something else. So let's tell the incoming council that they need to decide about these things. And it opens the door for the incoming council to have a useful conversation with the DCC about how we make it work between the two councils because it's a wee bit awkward when central government tells us to do something and cooperatively together as to how the staff are supposed to present it to us and what it will be unless we 
unless the council actually thinks more about it, what will happen is that whenever anything comes back to a council table, it will come back to one council table and then it will go back to the other council table with something in it that says, quite frankly, you've got no choices here, you just have to agree to it. it I mean, because once one has, we can't go back and change a quarter of it from the other one. So we have to find a way before it comes to both mm. councils, whatever the next steps are, so as that we don't end up with the first cab off the rank having the discussion and the second cab off the rank just going along, you know. So we've just got to find a way through the, the awkwardness that's um, because of how it's been set up. So I'm in, inviting the new incoming council to have a wee think about that. Do you want to speak as well, Kate? Oh, after others. Okay, yeah. sure. Anyone else want to say something, Councillor Scott? Um, I'm just pleased that there's a, a proactive structure for the ORC, the DCC and Mama Whenua, um, to put together a future development strategy for the urban area of the Lever City. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Councillor Noon. Oh, sorry about the delay. Hey, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Hey, look, I just wanted to comment. I agree already with the uh, um, comments made by Hillary and, and Kate with regards to the changes, the recommendations, but just with regards to recommendation two, I think that seems logical to me um, that the city um, lead the, um, or the lead coordinator uh, considering their urban planning experience, uh, but also on the infrastructure side of things, roading, pipe infrastructure, um, et cetera, um, that wealth of experience that they got that they, they bring to the table, it seems logical that they are the lead. However, we equally contribute um, uh, with regards to natural hazards, science, monitoring, et cetera, but it seems to me that we dovetail into them rather than they dovetail into us. So comfortable with two, comfortable with the amendments that have been made. Thank you. Anyone else before we go to rights of reply? So, or do you want to speak and then have a right of reply? I've got no right of reply. It's a right of reply held by. I'm yeah. happy to give Kate my right of reply, which will shorten this process. <laughs> I'm, I'm really delighted with this, but what I want to explain is we had a fantastic workshop yesterday on the Green Sun model, which Dunedin doesn't know about. <laughs> yes. um, and so I think there's some really big benefits <laughs> of us having a much more nuanced discussion about who else could be stakeholders in this um, group and have some input into it. And that's a, a we've got time to deal with it at the moment. So that's where I would like to see us um, learning from. And, and we're lucky as a regional council to have um, Alexa and Andrew in those meetings. And so we can reflect on that as being a really, really good model. Um, the other part of that is what I think is really key to get governors in there is understanding as governors sit on the Regional Land Transport Committee, the expectations on future development and the need to have public transport being there at the start of new development, not at the end. That is absolutely crucial. And as we're looking at where we may be putting in future um, development, <coughs> we need to understand that roading network. And while we've still got something to do with buses, and I um, hope we do for some time only for the purposes of regional bus services, we, sh we should be in that mix as governors as well. We're on the RLTP, uh, or Regional Land Transport Committee, we should be understanding this much better holistically. Thank you. At this point as well, I wanted to um, just say thanks to the DCC for being actively engaged and taking up a lead coordinator role. Um, for us being hold of this space is um, really important. It's a rapidly evolving space as well. Our new res joint responsibilities in terms of urban development. Um, is important and our relationship will evolve in terms of that. But the environment is also shifting in terms of three waters and um, local government reform. And the fact that we are here signaling a strong relationship that is open to evolving as well is really important. Uh, I agree, we heard a really interesting um, briefing from Queenstown yesterday in terms of the approach there uh, and what's possible when bringing in a number of players to the table. Uh, and I think that's probably where we're heading 
fact and reality. This is a starting point, but it's a really important one and we need to recognise the really good work that the DCC is doing in this space. Thank you to Jonathan and everyone else at the DCC. <coughs> um, yeah, and um, we're signalling here that we are really keen to be involved and let's talk further with the new council, whoever that is, as to what makes sense in that space. Thanks. Okay, so Hilary, would you like to do your writer reply? I think it's. You did it? No, you've done it. You've got one if you'd like to. No, it's it's been seen. Yep, okay then, we've got a mover and a seconder. Uh, shall we put them all together? I think we may as well, shouldn't we? So we've got a, do you want to get those up again, Di? We know what they are though. We have one to six now, is it? One to five. Yeah, one to five. Four. 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 One to four there. We haven't lost anything we need to have. Oh, I've got probably for food. Okay, yeah, just double checking that. Sorry, I'm a bit behind you. Oh, okay. We've got the mover and the seconder all in favour. Aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Next paper then. <coughs> Sorry, we've got the um, Queenstown Lakes District Council um, Future Development Strategy. And Lisa, you were doing that one as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just as I said before, I'll just take you through a little bit of an overview, but um, this is off the back of the briefing that we had yesterday um, with QRDC, which set out um, a different opportunity, I guess, in terms of the structures to how we approach the FDS with them. Um, the main difference being that, um, that they've obviously got their um, quite detailed spatial plan work that's been completed and was adopted in the middle of um, last year, um, and that we're proposing through this process to utilise that as the basis for the FDS to build on that work um, to revisit it where we need to through um, the partnership with them but to use that um, piece of work really as, as the basis as it does satisfy a lot of um, the requirements under the MPS UD. Um, but the other main difference too is the partnership approach. So in developing that spatial plan, um, QDC have been part of the Grow Well Fiora partnership, which ORC are now um, partners of. Um, and that has a structure um, which is set out in the paper, which sets up initially at the high level at the governance, governance structure, which we have representation from Councillor Forbes and Councillor Noon on, but it also has ministerial representation, um, Mana Whenua representation um, at that at that level then we move down into um a basically i guess the executive level which um has or steering committee level which has um representation for us from gavin and anita um, sit on that um level of partnership then we come down to the joint working program partner um, level or integration level which is i guess um aimed at providing an officer level um overview of the whole process but at um a view that integrates, I guess, across the various different parts of our two councils. So uh, Warren Hanley and um, Doug uh, Rogers are on that, that um, group for us. And then there's a project team, which is, I guess, the, the running of the process, which at the moment I'm the one that is sitting on that process. So the Grow Well Fire Partnership, as I said, has been set up for quite some time, since 2020, and was the initiative um, from central government um, when they agreed to start doing some joint spatial planning for key um, cities around New Zealand and Queenstown was one of those. Um, so the partnership's already set up. Um, it's got a lot of projects underneath it that range from, I guess, the, the spatial planning process ran through that process, but also now they're delving into the detail of key priority areas, um, things like Ladies Mile. There's a task force that's being set up um, out of that to try and align um, the growth and infrastructure development through Ladies Mile. Um, and because that partnership's set up, it makes sense, I guess, for the FDS to fit within that partnership. Um, in saying that though, um, obviously the decision of the FDS ultimately still rests with both the councils, um, but it's important I think to acknowledge the opportunity that the Grow Well Fire the Partnership and the level of engagement that we have through that of those key agencies in developing this. So it's a different um, 
model that, um, of partnership that we're proposing through this paper. Um, and that's reflected, I guess, in, in the two um, key recommendations that are put forward in the paper. The first one being that um, we request your endorsement to, to use that spatial plan as the base and to build from it. Um, and then the second one being use, endorsing the use of the Grow Well Fiber partnership to deliver this joint work with QLDC. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, questions at this point, Council Forms in cover. Uh, thanks for that, Lisa. Uh, after yesterday's um, presentation, I've got one question, which I don't know if you can answer, but I think it's worth raising. And that is that this, um, the spatial plan for Queenstown seems to really, really hinge on mode shift 40% by 2048, but nowhere in that spatial <coughs> plan did there seem to be a plan to create that mode shift. And I wonder what our responsibilities are going to end up in that space given that it doesn't seem to be thought through yet. Mm. Not, not sure that I'm um, <laughs> able to answer that in, in a lot of detail, other than I guess um, that might be one of the key elements we look at from the spatial plan in terms of obviously the role of the FDS is to feed into the long-term plan and that for us as a council may have consequences around our public transport services. So I think that's probably an opportunity maybe to at one area where we might be able to build on that spatial plan to delve into a little bit more detail about what that actually means and maybe get some more direction to make sure, I suppose, that what comes out of the FDS doesn't sign ORC up to two that's things that we're unable basically. to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, 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 I guess, a point that I can take forward and take back to that project team as, a, as something that we may want to table in those first initial discussions on building on the spatial plan. Noting, of course, that Council Forbes and Councillor Noon are members of the Orwell Biowara partnership at the moment. Um, right, so I've got a list here. We've got Councillor Calvert, Noon, <coughs> and then Wilson, Hillary. Just, I probably should understand this better, but number three is describing using a partnership to deliver it in partnership with QLDC. So are we partners with the partnership and QLDC or are we partners with the QLDC and they've got an advisory role? Or how do we, what do those words mean as to who's? Both sponsors. I use that word, that doesn't help me. Um, so <laughs> it's a good point. Um, and perhaps we could, you know, it could be where to be, but I guess the Grow Well Forward Partnership has both QLDC and ORC on in our own right, I guess, in our own entities. Um, but as I said, the, the the requirement under the NPS is for councils to jointly prepare and then to jointly adopt um, the FDS. So I guess in some ways it's almost, it is confusing that it's two partnerships or a partnership that we're part of, but then a responsibility maybe with QLDC to actually prepare the FDS. Does that um, clarify it? Yes and no, yes. But it doesn't help me understand where the Grow Well partnership that's an are they an advisory group to the peer of councils who are in partnership? Uh, so you, I'll, I'll have a crack, Lisa. Um, so through you, Chair. Um, so no, the so the Grow Well partnership was um, put together under the um, government's uh, urban priority areas, um, and so it's got a broader set of strategic objectives than just the FTS. Um, but they're delivering a lot of what the FTS requires us to do. So the proposal is we use that partnership as the vehicle to deliver the FDS. I think if there was a comma after FDS in that uh, recommendation, um, so the idea is that rather than developing a separate partnership that will be doing many of the same things, we utilise the one that already exists um, with Queenstown Lakes, who are the only two organisations in the partnership that have the statutory requirement to deliver the FDS. They're not the only two organisations in the partnership, though. What, what I'm looking for is to, to understand whether the umbrella comes from that Grow Well Iota partnership, which um, is an umbrella lot that doesn't just include us two, um, or whether it's Queenstown Lakes and us doing something where we're getting advice and help and other things from that partnership that involves other people. Who's, who's in charge of what and who's, 
What's the relationship between us all here? So, so only ORC and QL have requirements to deliver the FDS. Um, and what we're proposing by using the Grow Well partnership is that we are essentially bringing the stakeholders, rather than having them as a stakeholder relationship, they become part of the group that delivers it. Um, but the reality is those groups don't have any statutory responsibility to do this. Um, and they've been formed for another purpose. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily that one directs the other, um, but there, there very well could be a situation where um, those partners want something that is different to what the two organisations that have to deliver the FDS want, um, which, you know, could create a conflict. Does it sort of come back to us? Sorry, I'm just... I like to understand where people sit with each other, and I'm just thinking that it's likely, it seems to me, that it comes back to us as sort of a recommendation from this partnership, who was us anyway, and so we, we sort of think, well, we've been part of this all the way along and things, and um, it'll be like they've developed it for us, it seems to me, but then is it therefore advising us on things because that makes sense to me that they go and do the work and the future development strategy essentially might be the question Hillary. Yeah that well if, we, if we're delivering it are we just picking up what is recommended by that group? So, mate, so I guess how I think it will work on the ground is um, the level that I'm involved at that project level team um, that project level team has offices from QODC as well as Kaunga Ora, Waka Kotahi, um, and we'll have import from Mana Whenua as well. So we'll be developing, I guess, the material. Um, so they will have, they will be advising us and being involved in that development. Um, we will then be bringing that material to, um, to you as well as to the QRDC Council at key points to seek input and guidance on it. Um, it'll, and then if there's any, I guess, kind of uh, conflicts arise <coughs> or things that we need to have higher level sign off, we will then be pushing it back up that Grower Fire Partnership. But ultimately, when we have a draft FDS, that will come to both councils for councils to endorse uh, or to, to approve. And then once both councils have approved, the FDS would then go to the Grow Well Fire Partnership for their endorsement. Um, that's kind of how it worked with uh, QRDC on developing their spatial plan in that this partnership inputted to develop it, but it was the QRDC Council that approved it in July last year, I think it was, and then in October last year, the Grow Well Fiota Partnership endorsed it, which then I guess meant that those other partners around the table as part of the um, Grow Well Fiota Partnership then had a, a spatial plan that they're now working to, to deliver their so does that mean we can't decide? We have to send it off to them to endorse at the end of the day? No. So you, we, we, councils decide and approve, so it is actually the FDS then that the mm. two councils are required mm. to deliver under the NPS, but then we'd be asking for the Grow Well Fire Partnership to endorse it as, I guess, kind of an additional Would it then stand. be active? I mean, what would we have decided it then and we just send it to them as a matter of courtesy or...? It's all in, um, in paragraph 10 and 11. It's all spelt out loud and clear what the situation is. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so just... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can understand Whatever. Hillary's yeah. question. I think everyone can. That who has the ultimate responsibility to sign off an FDS, essentially? And the answer was... Two councils by somebody who wasn't us, so okay, that's fine. It has to be continuous, <laughs> so we can stay until now. Well, it's often at this time of the day, I remember yes. in our meetings that we have one of those. Everything's good at this point, okay. Anyway, um, it'll just it'll de develop, so, and sooner or later, it'll probably come back, but. It troubles me that we can decide on it and we're obliged to decide on us on Queenstown Lakes and then somehow there's another <laughs> process about it being endorsed because I don't understand its status between that and when it's endorsed by a group who isn't those two players who have the obligation to deliver it. <laughs> Sorry. I might need to grab okay. a drink of water. Oh, 
Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, Council have known you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. I, I think the step uh, that Hillary's just been talking about um, is that the joint panel uh, is formed that considers a draft uh, FDS and then it recommends um, after a public process recommends to both councils a concluding document. So I think that's the step that um, finishes the process, so to speak. But however, my question for Lisa is uh, it's partly asked by Lisa before about uh, the spatial plan, plan process that had already occurred with Queenstown Lakes. You made that comment around revisiting elements. So I assume there are aspects of um, responsibility, whether it's mandatory um, from our perspective, uh, haven't quite fully been embraced in that spatial plan. So you see this really as a another opportunity to further those aspirations that we have. Have I got that right? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, it's an opportunity, I guess, to refine um, what our input has been and our aspirations. Um, the spatial plan did have ORC input um, and there were things that QLC, QLDC took off the table, I guess, through um, concerns from council around hazards and, like, for example, Glenorchy is a perfect example of that. That's not an area that they've promoted will be at any growth um, to occur through the spatial plan. Um, and the stage that we're at now is that they're delving into their priority areas within that spatial plan. Uh, delving into this to, to the um, priority areas within that spatial plan that go to that next level of detail. So we're still involved in that as well. So there might be some priority areas that are in that spatial plan where we've flagged there might be some hazard risks that we've got to look at in more detail and then provide that development guidance through their district plan processes going forward that actually take account of that hazards um, issues, but it wasn't a, as big enough a concern for us to say completely take it off the table um, like we had through the spatial plan. But I think um, there probably are some areas as Alexa had flagged um, like around public transport where I think there's an opportunity for us to, you know, continue to build that relationship with QLDC and to refine mm -hmm. it through the FDS to make sure that that development capacity is occurring in areas where we um, as the agency that's delivering public transport know that we can. Cool, thank you. I support the recommendations we're, and are happy to move when you're ready, Madam Chair. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Malcolm. Uh, yeah, probably uh, uh, the real concern I have, and I understand where you're heading with it, is this so well. Just light it properly. <laughs> 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 that is, um, you, you, we've got every you know, every agency possible, possibly in there, Mana Fenner and everyone's in there, but you, you actually haven't got you haven't got the public in there. And so we're so the key to it is actually going to be what consultation you're going to do to see that that aligns. So there was a difficulty for me there. It does you don't know, seem to articulate that exception unless I've missed something, but it was community consultation. But on that group there is no there's no compute community involvement, which is a concern. There's um, no community involvement, I guess, in the, in the no. partnership structure, yes. but there will be community involvement through cool. the development. Um, and QLDC, I guess, flagged yesterday that that may um, take a variety, I guess, of approaches and won't just focus on developers. It's going to focus on broader community and um, the terminology that's often using the, the mum and dad developer, the people who just may have, yep. you know, an additional lot or capacity or things like that. So there will be community consultation built into the, the doing of the develop, developing the FDS. And, and, and the second one under financial considerations, and I did talk about this yesterday at that briefing, but, and this goes for both of the DCC one, uh, the Dunedin one and the Queenstown one, is at what start, uh, currently this is all general rated, and we've, say, we've said that it is budgeted work in this year's annual plan, but when does it become, when, when do we actually start looking at that? Because, you know, uh, Queensland's 97% 90, of its area's uh, outstanding natural features and all that sort of stuff, so they, they've got a real problem up there that's really Queenstown-centric. Dunedin's got a problem because of its size and what it's trying to do. Um, if all that money's going to be spent in those areas to solve their problems, you know, where does where does Palmerston and Milton ratepayers fit in that 
in that program and when do we actually have a look at that because I can see significant costs coming quite soon and developing things um, yeah, when does that start being looked at? So I guess if I can clarify, the financial considerations that are in this report relate to the FDS development. Yes. Um, so that's obviously <laughs> what um, the, the general rates is um, contributing to. Once we, I guess, we've developed the FDS and comes with, that, I guess, the implementation plan that then feeds into the LTP, that's probably when I guess that decision needs to be made. Mm -hmm. No, 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 that's good. They're only testing on electrical equipment, so maybe that's okay. okay. I can go yeah. over the yeah. so, so Perhaps we should go check. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Go. So, so the uh, sorry, Chair, just so, but the FDS is only required for two parts mm. of a target, isn't it? For Dunedin and Queenstown, because yeah, they're yeah, our two yeah. tier two. Well, Milton might need it. Palmerston might need it. Need Probably Ranfilly won't need it. Um, so, you know, I'm just wondering why that then it is a general rate as opposed to a targeted rate. You should be able to pay for it. Yeah. So, sorry? Should have paid for it finance rate. I don't think that's for the staff to. Yeah. No, no, no. I just, table yeah, I'm just trying to get an understanding that. of where that's coming from. Thank you. Can I, can I just add, um, yeah, while, yeah. while it's only our tier one and two councils that are required to do um, an FDS, actually, the MPSUD does encourage all councils to do them. So it's very likely that the other three councils can ask us um, and we would end up doing them across the region. Um, we haven't been approached yet, but that doesn't uh, mean that we won't be. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Kate. I'll let Kevin jump. That was my question and I yeah. was actually going to say, should it be a recommendation to it? Government puts a lot of things on us yeah. and when it's done, we just absorb it all the stuff, do the path of least resistance and think we'll just have that generally to a general rate. That actually shouldn't, there should be a stop, think about this, and what does that mean? We should be saying, what policy or principles are we working on that if this is a benefit for particular communities, even if the government gives it to us, we pass that on, that it shouldn't actually be. So the community understands. No, the community what understands for yeah, yeah, what they're paying for. So, okay. so that, that, that is, I think, and that's, I'm going to leave that with the finance committee. I don't even want to do a resolution about it. But I think it's a, a very live question as government keeps on putting things onto us. My other, um, I've got two, I have two questions on this. One is about Cromwell, because as we do this in Queensland Lakes, there can be a unintended consequences or intended consequences that requires some thought thinking, especially in transport, about Rommel and whether we should be having representation from CODC in there. And I appreciate that sometimes that's happening, but whether that should be more formalised because they're all yeah. almost one. They're really integrated, Queenstown and Rommel now. That's getting outside of this FDS though, isn't it? Well, no, the well, FDS, no, we have to manage that. urban development, generally regionally. Yeah. And if one's having an effect on the other, then we should be looking at it holistically. Um, I know that um, CODC are going to be a key stakeholder in the development of office, and they were in the spatial plan as well. Um, and I think um, Anita from QDC presented that yesterday, I guess, that it was part of what's happening in Cromwell was part of their considerations as to how Queenstown in particular would grow and develop and, and even Wanaka to a certain extent. So they will be involved. I guess they're not in the Grow Well Fire Order partnership at the moment because that partnership was set up specifically to deal with spatial planning at Queenstown. Um, but yeah, I, I, I take your point that they are a very key stakeholder. Yeah. Um, in this. And the only other question, and it's one that I haven't had answered yet, and I'm sure we're going to be given the information sometime, but the one that was raised about Esplanade Reserves and Esplanade, um, Esplanade Strips um, is, uh, as the body most concerned about water quality, what are we doing to ensure that those might be incorporated and future-focused way into Queensland Lakes area to ensure that we don't get um, unintended consequences to the quality of water, especially sediment in the short and long term. And I think that's a really live issue. And I know that's dealt with in part in the RPS, but I think we need to be better activated on that and giving direction to TAs. Following on from your question, I did look up last night into the, the directions from the RPS to district plans is a must. Um, so we are requiring now through the proposed RPS for district um, plans to, they must be considering the provision of Esplanade reserves, but obviously what 
the onus then is still on the district plans to take that up when they are doing their work. So outstanding water bodies we would require? It's, it's through the, uh, the land and water, the, sorry, the land and water chapter, the eco chapter and also the coastal chapter. So it's applying to certain, I'll, I'll send you the links to the specific provisions, but it's applying to um, the environment within those chapters. So for, so for land and water, it's applying to, you know, rivers, lakes. So, so they must consider what we don't make them must do, must require. Their district plan must include, okay. yeah, must, in, must include consideration of. Yeah. yeah. Anita, yeah. did you have something to say on that? Oh, I was just going to add, um, uh, Councillor Wilson mentioned outstanding water bodies. We've There's no policy positions that have been developed at all about outstanding water bodies yet, but that very well could be uh, one of the things that we look at doing in terms of um, protecting those once we've um, gone through the, the process of identifying, et cetera, because they do have a higher bar um, than anything that isn't, isn't an outstanding water body. Thank you. Councillor Hawes. Well, just a question. Um, given the fact that Queenstown are a long way down the road with their spatial plan, um, a spatial plan that covers their primary population areas, which is Queenstown <coughs> and Wanaka. Um, do we have to do too much? There are, um, there's requirements under the NPSUD that the spatial plan hasn't necessarily ticked off and it's in its fullness. So housing and business capacity assessments, we need to relook at those under the guise of the NPS um, UD to make sure that they're fit for purpose for the um, for the FDS. So there is additional we work. At, well, we've got to do it with QRDC. With, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that'll be in partnership um, with them, as it is that we're doing that in partnership at the moment with DCC as well. Um, so there are, I guess, additional pieces of work that need to be done. But in terms of the content of the spatial plan, I guess that's what I prefer to my previous comments around. It's an opportunity to refine the con uh, the content there to make sure that it does link well with that um, implementation piece around the LTP. I guess the reason I asked that question is, is, is for the obvious reason, and it, it, it was presaged a little by the fact that you're leaving. And that is, how many staff do we require to do this piece of work? One. And two, what's the time frame we've got to do it? So staff required time frame. Um, so staff required, I guess if we had a full complement of having two urban people that would that would be I guess enough for us to be able to assist and do our bit for QLDC and DCC um, in terms of the timing as I said before we with DCC we're still working through that final I guess project plan as to where the key points and, and touch points and um, deliverables will be but with um, QLDC in I can't remember what paragraph I'll just check paragraph 15 thank you Gavin um, we've set out what the time frames are roughly going to be at this stage um, for delivery, so um, we're looking at adopting for public consultation um, a FDS in oh, May, June yes. next 15. year. Yeah, is it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next question: the populations of Queenstown and Wanaka are respectively, according to the 2018 census, which is a crap census we all know, but unfortunately we've still got to go off it. Thirteen thousand five hundred for Queenstown, and nine thousand five hundred for Wanaka. The population for those. On the road is 13,107. So it's about the same size as Queenstown and bigger than Wanaka. And yet we're required to do this urban plan for here, and on is going to be placed to one side when the difference between Queenstown and Wanaka is obviously what, 60, 70, no, 100 kilometres if you go one way. Now the Crown Range about seven. Is that right? Does that make sense to you? Again, the directions come from central government, I yeah. guess. Yeah, as to as to where they see the growth pressures. Mm. It's not necessarily based on the size. Oh, so of it's areas. not based on size. It's based no, on it's the growth pressures. Growth rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's a seventy percent growth. Seven. Rate. Percent. Seven. Seven. Percent. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Compounding. So it won't be. It'll never be on really. No, well, no, it could be. Well, it could. That's what this <laughs> one's based on. It's based on that percentage, isn't that right, Anita? I'm pretty home. sure it is. It's the it's the it's the oh, compounding oh impacts. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, so the, it is about growth. So the tier one councils are you're really fast growing, and the tier two are um, slightly um, 
slower growing. It's a difference if the first MPSUD um, categorise them slightly differently. Um, and the, the point we made earlier is that um, if uh, Waitaki District wanted uh, to do an FDS for Oamaru, they could, um, and they could ask us to um, participate in that. But it is about growth rather than size. So that time frame then that you've got in paragraph 15, if you haven't got staff available to at the moment, Tanita, I guess this is your question, is it? Um, do you just contract out that role? Do we go and get consultants? So through your chair, we do have staff covering um, those roles at the moment. So we've got five staff across the policy and, and the transport teams, um, including Gavin and myself. Uh, when Lisa leaves, that will create a gap um, in one of those uh, team members. We will shuffle that. Um, and we have got a planned system of um, fire alarms going on at the moment. Oh, I've got a check on that, and that's what's oh, happening. Right. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so so where we are possible, we'll oh, avoid no. using consultants um, on this. Um, there's other work that we can um, more easily um, use consultants for and, and use our own staff for this, for this particular project or these projects. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, Councillor Hope, and then we've already got a mover for this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we're not into yeah. debate yet. Yeah, I was just about to mm -hmm. suggest we might do that. We've got Councillor Noon, I think, who moved this. I'll second second to Councillor Wilson. Now we can do that, Councillor Hope. Well, I definitely support this. I think the workshop yesterday. Let that go. The growth pressure is probably the, the key word here. I um, mean, the housing, the land use, infrastructure planning, which including transport, is at Paramount in Queenstown. And you can see that we have to try. They have to try out there to do something. Um, I think it's fantastic. We've got councillors Forbes and Councillor Noon on it. Um, it's very, very, it's very, very well structured. Um, and you can tell, I mean, obviously land banking is not the answer up there, but there's got to be other options. Um, like you say, Mrs. Hawkins, about, you know, mum and dad, Having, having to um, be part of, of the plan or solution or putting their, their, their two cents worth in. I think anything up there is, they have to try. Um, that's my first thing. And my second thing, may I say, if you do not mind, is I'm sorry you're going, Mrs. Hawkins, because you've been here at least four, five years, yeah, five years since we were here, and you've been on a lot of projects. I wish you very much all Thank the you. best for all of us, and I'm sorry that you're away. I'm a bit sad about that. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, anyone else want to say anything on this? I just want to say very quickly, though, I endorse Councillor Forbes' comment uh, on this issue, that I think if we're going to go down to Queenstown, you must drag Cromwell in. Uh, it's a high-growth area. It's the fastest-growing um, town, as I understand, all the statistics New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand. And um, they are an integral part of the economy and culture of Queenstown. Mm. We um, had a really good discussion on that yesterday as well of what's been happening already in bringing um, Central Otago District Council in for those very good reasons you've talked about and um, that will continue. Um, yeah, as you say, formally the tier one, isn't it, um, zone isn't Cromwell, but <laughs> it makes absolute sense and that's what's been happening, so that's good. Um, I just wanted to say as well um, how impressed I was yesterday when we did have the briefing in terms of the um, how far we actually are down the track together on this one already. Um, there's some really tangible projects in place already under the um, previous strategy and plan. Um, and yeah, we do have some further requirements for urban planning, but, uh, and also as Councillor Noon said, we've also got aspirations as well that we can bring to the table. It's an opportunity to uh, reinvent um, rather than just stamping what we've already got as well. So that's good that we're doing that together. And the fact that we um, have been doing that in a really tangible projects-based way and bringing in um, partners like central government as well, and really helpful way um, yeah I was really impressed by that and um, how uh, practical and positive and actually useful this is going to be going forward I think so yeah 
well done. And thanks to QLDC for your leadership in this area as well. Yep, we've got mover and a seconder. We've got some recommendations there. Anyone else really want to say something at this point? Can I just have a quick word of reply? Yep. Yeah, sure can. Hey, hey look, um, but you, you've sort of stolen my thunder a little bit, but I think we've, um, we need to be grateful for Queenstown Lakes uh, with regards to the work they've they've completed with the, the draft spatial plan and the willingness uh, to embrace a partnership structure as well, where um, a lot of the groundwork has um, has already been done. So they're well down the track. And in terms of the uh, comparison uh, costs um, and time compared with um, Dunedin City, it will be, I imagine, uh, a much more um, efficient and cost-effective project. So, um, yeah, I just reinforce or endorse those three recommendations. Great, thanks. Okay, well, we'll put those then. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Next one then, uh, in a similar vein, is South Dunedin um, Future Program Plan. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Lisa, and endorse all those comments about how wonderful you are. <laughs> is it, when are you away? Uh, six weeks. So yeah, I've taken um, position at Taranaki Regional Council, so I don't have to travel. So I'm still in the regional sector. So you have you to go. Go. Oh, yeah. me completely. Thank you. Like, how come you're in the Taranaki Regional Council? Is that so home? Or? It is now. Yeah, yeah. so I've moved to the <laughs> community. Um, yeah, when I'm on the journey, we'll go. Yeah, good luck. You'll still see me. You'll still see me. <laughs> no, thanks, Joe. 7.3, South Dunedin. Jonathan, would you like to pick us off on this one? Um, obviously, a very similar paper was presented last week to the DCC. And, um, yeah, we had the recommendations there that we've seen. So would you like to introduce to us um, what we are doing here today as well? Thank you, oh, sorry, we do have Jean Luc online as well from the um, ORC. Um, yeah, between yourselves. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I appreciate that there's been a lot of paper provided, but I'll so I won't go through it in depth, but I'll just try and skim over some of the key points. So, in essence, I think since I was last here, we've managed to kind of pull most of it together, or what we think anyway. And we haven't come up with the answers, but we think we've landed a process that over the next sort of four years or so, we'll be able to step through all of the kind of key issues that are going to come up, um, work through those with partners, stakeholders, and decision makers around what all that looks like. Um, pull it apart, have a good look under the hood, and put it back together again, and hopefully arrive at some, some consensus pathways about how we're going to take, take all this forward. Um, while it's going to be a four-year process, I don't think there's a need to wait until the end before we start making decisions. I think the program is going to be informed by a lot of work, the, the FDS being one piece of work that we've just spoken about, that will inform what we do in the South Eden space. And I think throughout the four years of the program, we'll, we'll be producing products that I think um, different parts of the two systems in terms of ORC and DCC, as well as other interested parties will be able to use that information to inform our thinking what they what they do and, and, and what directions they they head in. Um, so we don't need to wait. I think the program it's probably important at this stage to, to get a sense of the program is not going to be sort of a large adaptation project that at the end of it we come up with a whole lot of adaptation stuff mm -hmm. that we have a budget for and that we do and that somehow sits outside of or parallel to all the BAU work that DCC and ORC does. Rather, we see the program as being a horizontal initiative that sits across all of that work and it produces a whole lot of products and information that informs all of the VAU work that's done across councils. So we would have colleagues in natural hazards and three waters and transport that receive information from the program and that shapes and informs their budgeting, their planning, their decision making in a way that starts to weave in adaptation climate adaptation into their day-to-day -day work and in that way you you integrate it into our day-to-day -day business and you start to sort of turn the super tanker around that is the two councils in a direction where a lot of the decisions the investments the activity that occurs is consistent with what we, what we're hearing from the scientists around what's happening with climate change and what we think sort of 
economic, the social, and cultural impacts of those changes are going to be. Um, I think I'll stop there. I could talk for hours on the stuff, but um, and happy to take questions. Sure, questions for <coughs> Council Scott, Laws, Calder. Cool. I, <clears throat> I like what I read and I like what I hear. Nevertheless, um, and so you're talking about integrating. Uh, some strategies into our <coughs> normal work programs. Um, so, for example, Fulbury Park. I read, I read in the newspaper the other day that part of Fulbury Park has been sold to the local school, and, and maybe the rest of Fulbury Park has been. We truly integrate um, opportunities that arise into our day-to-day -day business because it seems to me that Fulbury Park is actually a, a huge opportunity for a line in the sand. So you've jumped to a solution. <laughs> well, well, yeah, my question is, so at what point... My yeah. question well, is... I said that's probably quite a specific and not on the... Yeah, no, my question team, is... But, my question is, at what point do we start integrating yeah. into our business? That was simply an example. I well, yeah. So translating to practical solutions. And I think you touched on that, didn't you? That we don't need to wait till the end of the yeah. four years to start to do stuff. So yeah. I think that is on track. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, if you'd like to answer, Jonathan. So, Chair, I, I can't provide an answer. So, as an example, I had a conversation the other day with the DCC property team where they got in touch and said, look, there's a couple of properties that have come up in South Dunedin and they have a certain set of characteristics. Does the program have a view on whether we should look to purchase those or not? What the response was that we said, okay, well, we're not quite as far down the track as we would yeah. need to be to make specific recommendations on certain areas. However, we can provide general observations, general characteristics around, for example, we might, if the property has a number of DCC properties around it, we would see that as higher priority because then you could get a larger yeah. cluster and that would make a larger area that you might then use at a later stage as cool. transitioning that land use, say, to a green space. So if it was a, a, a council housing development and, and it comes up for renewal, you might say, okay, well, we're going to look at an option of instead of renewing, we might transition that to a green space and look at another green space in another area of the South D that is low risk, and we might develop that into housing, you know, new modern housing. That's the program's really about how do you get as many of these chips on the table as possible. Exactly. So let's go back to Fulbury Park. I would have thought that was a huge opportunity. That's one big cluster for using your words. Yes, and I understand um, that there's a process at the moment. Um, where the owners are looking at selling and there's a conversation. It's not directly in my patch, so I'm not, I, I've fed similar views into that process, but I'm not directly involved. So, I'm, so no, but, no, but when is it going to be integrated, some type of strategy, like this gentleman's articulated, when's that going to be integrated I guess into so, our so, business? Yeah. When, when is that going to be integrated? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or no. There's a question well, there from Councillor Scott. Is, yep, when when will the property be coming to you and saying, well, actually, this is, cons and as Councillor Laws has said, at what point are we in a policy realm yeah. um, to move forward? So I think in the, we're going to go through several iterations. I think mid next year, we should have, the program should have produced a high level list of um, adaptation options. That'll be non spatial. The mm -hmm. second step is to make that spatial. So once we start to layer up, if you think the natural hazards layer, there's a socio-economic kind of characteristics layer that we put on top, then we put a third layer around adaptation options. That should give us a spatial sense of what parts of South Dunedin have high risk, low social and economic values attached to them, for example. And then that'll give us a better sense of being able to say to all the different groups, look, you should really look at investing here, you should look at investing there when that comes up. The, the catch being, of course, uh, I'm kind of uh, you want to have be able to influence all of it because if it's low risk, um, that might be something that we could procure and use to change land use. If it's high risk, we might be 
wanting to do the same, but for similar reasons, one for, to promote growth and one to kind of restrain it, restrict it. If that makes sense. So I, I think in the next 18 months to two years, I would think the program would have be able to have a material impact on Like being in an MRI scan or something, <laughs> yeah. Okay, next person then is Council Laws. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll let me see, uh, hold my um, major comments until we get to the debate stage. But the thing that seems to be conspicuously missing from this is central government. Um, which is why I think this plan is not going to work. Um, and I'll tell you why more in the debate space. But I understand that you really are an unfortunate creature of two, you personally, of two organisations that you've got to feed into your account, with both the DCC and to the IRC. And so if they set governance decisions, you've got to connect. I'm going to ask you, if you were able to construct this yourself on the basis of what you know, your intellect, your insight, your experience, your background. Um, would you be excluding central government as being a partner in developing a four-year program? Um, Councillor responding, I think I might draw on a resource that was recently produced by central government. Um, so the National Adaptation Plan was right, right. recently put out. One of the things that was up in lights at the front of that, both in terms of the ministerial forward and the comments from the PM uh, for media when it was launched, was around the risks associated with climate change and adaptation are going to need to be shared. It, it won't be that the government can take, take on all of that risk. They'll be shared across asset owners, local government, central government, insurers and others. So <clears throat> um, do I think that they're a critical partner in this? Absolutely. Um, and if I was designing this and, you know, we have had a major hand in designing the program. Um, yeah, I would absolutely have them as part of that. Um, because it seems to me that basically... To say, listen, you could set this up as a prototype for how we handle um, climate adaptation throughout New Zealand. And I think she's, personally, I think she's right. Um, in addition to which, this is a unique set. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, significant climate change. There's, I can't think of a region in New Zealand that has the same. There's hundreds of houses here, or there might be scores, so something like Te Awang or Hao Moana or something like that. But nothing like this. Mm. Council response, I, I would say we are having those conversations. So I, I'm actively talking to New Zealand Treasury, to Ministry for Environment, um, to other councils. There's a whole range of networks at, at officials' levels that, that share this information. Um, and also, I guess it's a question about timing, yeah. looping this back to Councillor Scott's conversation. You know, at, at what point do you have those conversations with, with central government? And yeah. is that around, well, we are having a conversation now. But in terms of um, how much clarity do we want on a strategy, on the direction, on, on where the kind of, which areas we might be looking to do which things in, what we think that might cost, you know, uh, my sense is that we need to develop a little bit more here if, so we have a better sense about what direction we're going, what key elements look like, and that then you can have a more substantive conversation with central government. This is also happening in parallel to a whole lot of reform, obviously, RMA, um, uh, three waters and the like, one of the pieces of, of legislation that's going to come out of that would be a Climate Adaptation Act um, that will deal with issues around managed retreat, as an example. We're actively engaging in and informing the development of that policy now, but we sort of need to land that and have that overarching national architecture in place before we can progress the program. For example, past the point of saying, hey, look, here's a long list of adaptation options we want to narrow that to a short list. Most people are going to want to know who's paying for what before you start narrowing down options. So we're very well integrated with what's happening um, at central government in Wellington. There's a lot, there's a lot of moving parts and, and you know, coordinating that will be 
I don't see that though in the recommendations of this paper. See what? Sorry. Well, all I see is two organisations involved over a four-year period, which is the DCC and the IRC. Yeah, I guess in the paper, um, at risk of making it extensive and, and, and listing everyone that has an interest, uh, I think central government cited in the scope definition and, and, and as mentioned as a stakeholder um, in, in, the, in the process. Um, they, they have many hats in that in terms of you know, uh, landowners, MOE in a government sense is a, is a landowner, um, the legislator, um, lots of different agencies central and local um, will have an interest in it. So can I pursue this? Just one more question, if I may, please. Yes, the yeah, fact of the matter is that the DCC hasn't got any money. The RRC is, if it's going to actually contribute to this, is going to have to levy the people who live here. It won't be a general rate on the people of Central Otago or on or anywhere else. So it's a poor community. It's one of the mm. lowest socioeconomic communities in any group area in New Zealand. Um, central government's going to have to be a prominent funder, probably the primary fund for any solution. Wouldn't you think it clever to put them in? They can't hear when the alarm's going off or in for a few seconds after when it stops. So, and that'll include the recording of the meeting. So, yeah, anyway, sure. I'll hear now. But paragraph 13 refers to the central government. <coughs> yeah, I know that, but it doesn't, it, that's not the recommendation for it. Yeah, that's true. The, um, Thanks, Jonathan. So, I guess from my, um, from my perspective, central government is involved in this and there's always opportunity to do more. I, I think the other point I'd make. It's yet to be determined what this might look like, let alone what it might cost. And if you think about the horizontal sense of the initiative and how it might inform our day-to-day -day business, we're not necessarily going to end up in a place where we have a large capital project that needs lots of external funding. This might be as much about doing what we currently do, but doing it differently um, and having a, a longer-term approach to some of that. Um, and to just thinking, what are the different ways of achieving a similar outcome? So if we may well get to a point where we do need to build something big and we need, need a lot of money and we need to have a conversation with people about that. But I think until we get a sense that that's where we're going to end up, um, we might not necessarily have to have those conversations now. I think recommendation seven two there about obviously recognising that future um, governance would need revisited as well. And as you've said, it's such an evolving space, isn't it? Even the infrastructure and three waters and who's going to be a partner yeah. in this going forward is obviously going to change. So <laughs> yeah, anyway, we're still in the questioning part. So we have got next Councillor Calvert and then Councillor Hope and then Malcolm Calvert. Two related questions. Um, I couldn't understand what the difference in financial effect on us of option one or option two is. Um, so the budget, I think, refers to a figure of 920,000. That's jointly across both DCC and ORC. So essentially half a million from DCC, 420,000 from ORC. So in a way, it's a little bit odd in that the funding's already been approved, it's already in the long-term plans. So the, the paper really is around proposing what that money should be spent on or, or a way that that could be spent. Um, similarly, um, there's already been a decision made to adopt the program, program approach in the sense that the role that I'm currently in has been created. And, and what, And in some ways, um, it's very it's very difficult to determine what what the financial implications would or the difference between the two would be. And the reason I say that is that if we take a programmatic approach, there's there's my role as a program office, um, which has a clear budget. However, it will work horizontally. It will engage with staff 
um, it will require some contributions from across the agencies. There will be a cost associated with that. It's difficult to quantify what that is because typically, typically council staff don't operate um, like lawyers or accountants and you know, budget their time by six minute increments. Um, and, and similarly, if you if you told, took an alternative approach and said, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna go with the, the status quo option that doesn't have a program office, but there needs to be some conversations around, well, the work that's outlined in this plan, do you either do it or not do it? Um, in which case you would need to assign resourcing to that. Um, you'd also need to either um, allocate existing staff to that or, or to develop new staff. So I would say that you might not be the, sorry, uh, you're probably struggling because you might not be the right person to ask this because I might be asking a turkey how to organise Christmas here um, because it might be affecting you <laughs> and, and what you're doing. Um, so we're being asked to choose from two options, one of which staff clearly don't like in this report because it says this will be a bad idea for the following reasons and the reasons include that it, to me, what the two options seem to be is one of them is sort of absorb it within a bits of staff doing here and there and whatever, and the other option being a standalone sort of. Those have got to have different financial things apart from just that one is an integrated thing and one is a standalone sort of thing and I can't get as I say it maybe you're not the right person to answer that because it isn't a fair question for you but maybe it's for Dr Pam. <clears throat> yes so with, with option one which is the program there's obviously the explicit program costs and you're in the program plan that's the cost of the program office with option two where it's business as usual with no form of coordination you would uh, avoid that cost, and it says so on page 31 of the report, uh, the advantage of option two. There would still be some cost though with option two, but you'd, you'd still need some sort of way of coordinating the respective GAU work programs of each council. But it's quite hard to quite hard to value that, put a number on that. So there'll be some, some cost there, but it's difficult to value that un, unlike the program office cost where we are able to price that. Perhaps if I could help by my second question, which is the what we're contributing to this 370, the 370 apart from the 50,000 OIC, is essentially has a... Um, Monitoring and investigating mode. Everyone says, oh, they've got meetings today. Yeah. We don't own the building. They may have done that. That's all the, the, the owner. Person, the owner. Saying. Thanks. Been well. Good Good to 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 um, um, that says that our 370 is to be spent on hazard monitoring, investigating, and identifying future natural hazard impacts. So that doesn't talk to anything that you've been describing. That's a separate issue. So those things would be the same one way or the other, I presume, because they're, they're just somebody either out there or internally doing that body of work. So um, the difference must be in the 50 grand consumables funding or whatever it is, um, in the two options, or have I misread that? Yeah, that's, that's correct. So for option one, there's, uh, and you're, I think you're referring to page 67 of the agenda, this program budget table. Yes. 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 So the row there that is ORC funding personnel, $50,000 uh, in each of those years is ORC's contribution to the program management office. Yes. For option one, preferred yes. option. If we went for option two, that would not be. Uh, a, a cost because we wouldn't have a program office. On the other hand, we would incur some cost because we'd still have to do some sort of coordination with PCC. So what you and, and, it, and, it might, and it might be a similar cost. Yeah. So what you're basically saying is both options have your est best estimates, fifty grand for for the, the program, whatever it is, correct. coordination thing. That's correct. That makes some sense, and so that means that our contribution generally to 
this whole thing is really, for the most part, has an identification in place. So if that's our role, it's sort of a DC, not only DCC led, but it's really about the DCC making decisions and other sorts of things. I don't know, uh, is it appropriate for us to be more than just a, we're providing these services? Because that's our role for the, these three years is essentially about hazards. Is that, but we're not so much partners as somebody who supports this thing because of the hazards. Because that's, that seems to be our sort of contribution. Yeah. We've just had a paper on the future development strategy as well. And we'll Transport is a whole range of different things, um, amenity, the, uh, naturalness, the coast, all of those types of things that we have directed. But we're not in, doing any of these things for these three years. There's no suggestion that we would be. The suggestion is only that we're doing things about hazards and contributing our 50%. So we're doing all these other things, and that's all coming out of a budget of 50 grand contribution, and we're doing quite well, probably. Um, because this is a three-year budget, and it is basically us spending money on hazard stuff. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to think about the program as I may use the term chorus before, and that it, it'll straddle sort of the breadth of both councils, and there'll be lots of different elements that contribute <laughs> and are informed by and inform. Certainly natural hazards will be a primary focus, but um, Council of has mentioned a number of different areas. There's lots of different work streams, FDS being one of them that we'll plug into. Um, so it's not, uh, I would caution against kind of trying to identify specific elements of either council's work programs that are linked to the program and that others that aren't. Mm. It's just because it's in here saying that. I, I think we're getting, every, everything else we're getting, we're getting for that 50 grand, so it's probably very well, money very well spent on. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Jean Luc. Thank you, Sir, Mrs. Chair. Um, part of the budget, and that's some work we're doing now. We're working with DCC on adaptation planning. So we we are co-funding also, for example, work we're doing with NIWA on adaptation planning. So that's not only natural hazard investigation and monitoring. So it that budget. Most of it is for hazard investigation and monitoring, but for the moment, there is a part of it that is used for planning adaptation, uh, which is more than just at 50,000. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, sorry, back to where we were. Actually, Councillor Hope, you were next, then Malcolm <coughs> Wilson, Scott, uh, Councillor Moon, no, no, you're all right. Thank you. And on page 85 of your of your paper, you've got a really good glossary. And I thank you for that because I appreciate reading it. And it's really quite nitty gritty. On the second uh, in the A's, you've got ad adaptation to climate change. Um, if you read down to the, the second line, it says produce harm and take advantage of new opportunities um, in natural systems adaptation as the process adjustment. And I just wanted to know, I've put a wee ring around any new opportunities. Is there any new opportunities or Dr. Palmer or Jean-Luc may be able to explain to me that, that you have incurred or thought about, please? Well, you, Madam Chair, I think the Forbury Park is a good example of that where an opportunity comes along which can be incorporated and considered for, for adaptation. So that's the kind of thing that's meant by the definition. Yes. Yes. Isn't just as an example. Thank you. I did think that, but I just wanted to clarify. Thank, Thank you. you. Malcolm. Oh, I've got so many questions. <laughs> so little time. Well, I'm really yeah, quite no, no. for the oh, yeah, go quick. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy to move, but I had one question about the motion, and that's um, just been a bit suits. So don't mm -hmm. do it now. Is the word likely and before natural hazards and the recommendation six, I think it is. Um, I just would like to delete that because I think that's I just don't understand. I mean I don't know how you can do this. We have to have the natural hazards work, and it's the, the likely and the I support. I don't mean to be pedantry. I leave that usually to Michael Baker. Um, take it out. I'll just say, do, do you, does it matter if we delete that word likely? Because I thought that was giving a, a message that I thought was 
and helpful. Mm -hmm. Might double check with Sean, Sean Luke. Okay. Oh, John, Luke. John Luke, did you hear that one? It seemed a softy, softy word that wasn't. Got that one? Oh, we can't quite hear you yet, John. That's Luke. what comes from modelling, Kate. So we're we talking about the recommendation, is it? And the Six. reference to likely. Yes. Just give me one second to find the. I, I would have thought we always would have to examine the wider natural hazards environment and to consider city-wide planning and infrastructure issues. I have no issue with removing one. Yeah, thank you. And uh, otherwise, I'm very happy to move, move them. I just want to make sure that people realise that we cannot ensure that the next council will endorse this programme in the long-term plan. But that's... I mean, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. It is subject to that. Are you, sorry, John, to add number six, is there any reason why the word likely should be in there? Needs to be in there. We took it out. No, that's all right. It can be yeah. removed. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Councillor Malcolm. Yeah, I'm just about organised that. Hey, that, that, so going back over the whole process of what we're trying to do here and uh, and the community involvement is uh, so you've got a phrase this over time, likely decades. This process process will gradually re reshape the mosaic and also then you go on to say remaining in sync with community priorities and the ability of the community uh, to absorb that change. So I wonder what you're actually doing to, uh, and knowing a lot of that community in there, uh, how you're actually going about communicating A, the time frames, that these could be long time frames, um, <coughs> and ensuring that the, the community understands uh, the programs and the thought patterns going over this, and also the, how are you actually evaluating that, that program that you've got in place to communicate that it's actually working? Um, thank you, Councillor. The, one of the things that we are going to be focus on, focusing on if the plan's approved by councillors We'll be trying to move the, some of the natural hazards and um, impacts conversations from qualitative to a quantitative space. So, you know, bad stuff is going to happen in the future to um, this is what we think is going to happen. This is when we think it's going to happen, probably in terms of decades, not maybe not years. Um, and this is what the physical impacts would be. Um, so that, that work, getting to that granular level is still, still to be undertaken. We also, again, if the, if the plans approve, there is a big process here around sort of science communications and program comms in general that'll also inform, inform and support the engagement work that we need to do from here, here forward. Uh, there's been a lot of engagement work done over the last two or three years, um, a lot of it preparing the ground for where we are now. Um, we've, we've, we think that that's been really effective. We're getting very positive feedback from a lot of, a lot of the stakeholders involved, but we're very conscious that we haven't spoken to everyone and you know, people need to be engaged in different ways. Um, so we do need to, um, I guess, scale up all of what we're doing in that space, and we'll be doing that in partnership with the people we're trying to reach, but also informed by kind of what what we've heard today. But um, one of the key actions is a is a constant engagement plan. That that would be one of the things we'd start tomorrow if, if this gets approved. Yeah, cool. Um... So that's really good. It's just this is going to be a critical to, to stop hysteria and the likes. And 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 following from what council laws were saying, like it is it is known as a level of high deprivation. Um, so yeah, it's just that involvement of so somewhere down the track, there's going to be a, a rating and position um, of things to do. So I'm probably just saying is the rate and the costing structure being looked at. You've got that in your mind to look at central government for that sort of assistance. We've certainly got that in mind. I think it, it's, we've got a lot, of, a lot of issues, a lot of challenges to work through. And I think that's one of the ones that's a little bit further down the list yeah. at the moment. Um, and I think, as I said, you made a comment before, and we probably need to do a bit of work to start to quantify what what those options could look like and what they might cost and then start to have a conversation around well to what extent could that be absorbed within existing budgets and processes if we just did things a little bit differently 
or and, and what would be the sort of residual uh, you know, cost that we, we would need to have a conversation with others. Yeah, an, an exemplar liquefaction area sounds like a good thing. We've got exemplar catchment groups and all that sort of stuff. Like it would be quite good for yeah. for the government, central government to do it. it could be quite quite a powerful tool for them. Yeah. But no, thanks. Thanks, you've helped me out. Good. Hey, Councillor Scott, waiting patiently. Yeah. Um, a final question, if I may. I, I'm just unsure how the decision around option one and option two feeds into the recommendations, or, or do the options are they sorted out down the track? Or can some clarification on that? Would be recommendations are option one. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that's really up to us to decide, isn't it? DCC have made their decision already. So is, is, is that implicit in the recommendations that it's option one? Why doesn't it say option one? Have they chosen DCC? That is implicit and it's just the drafting era. No, that's okay. I'm just trying to get to the answer. I'm not trying to point the finger. Um, so that's option one there. Cool. Thanks. Yep. I'm, I'm happy to kick that. off the, the 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 debating. Debate. Yeah, we've had some. Or oh, somebody said they were happy to move. Yeah. With, with that word alteration, that yeah. likely change yeah. or taken yeah. out. Mm. Yep. And a second of the end, Councillor yeah. Scott. Were you? Oh yeah. Yep. You're happy to do that. Okay. okay. We can go into. Give me a second. Oh, sorry, Councillor Scott. Said yeah. Yes. <laughs> we can go into debate now. Yep. Who would like to start off? Councillor Hope. Okay, thank you, Robinson. This was your home, South Dunedin. It was my home too when I was at boarding school. I see this as a new, a new lot of commitments that we take advantage of new opportunities. Um, the aim here is to develop and deliver an adapt adaptation strategy for South Dunedin that's viable, affordable, and it's also back for our community. I'm really more than happy to support this. Um, and I think one of the big things, as long as we take the community along with it and make sure that they and all ways shapes and forms are kept in the loop. And as Councillor Law says, there's a lot of deprivation there. Um, uh, and I still see people that don't have access to modern technology. So as long as somehow we can communicate this, I'm more than happy to back it. Thank you. I don't mean to be nasty. <laughs> But, but I, <laughs> I have got to have it. Uh, I have zero faith in the DCC and the LRC developing an insightful, clever, creative solution for South Dunedin. These are not attributes you automatically associate with either of these organisations. The local government sector is the living embodiment of linear, not creative thought. Uh, and frankly, I think that leaving it to two organizations to load. And then I got scared when and the answer came back, oh, uh, we're going to limit or narrow the options. And those words sent alarm bells ringing in me. That's the last thing that I need to hear. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to be voting for this motion either of these options because there are two sectors that have been excluded from this and I'd want them in on the ground floor. The first yeah. is I want the central government in on the ground floor. I don't want them coming in after you've narrowed the options. I want them brought in now because they are going to be critical to the financing and the formation of any plan that works. And I want to endorse publicly the commentary of Tyree MP Ingrid Leary. And she talks about this being the prototypical we have the, the prototypical project that we might use for climate change and mitigation in this country. And she's looking for something grand. So is Dunedin or South Dunedin, the people that are there. So is New Zealand. And I don't know, <laughs> it won't come out of the DCC and the IRC. The other aspect that's missing from here is the private sector. And I would have brought them in from day one. To, there is your creative sector. There are people who know how to risk a dollar. There are the entrepreneurs and the formulators. These are the people that I would have brought in from day that one as well. They would be part of my leadership. Um, and I would, they, they are not in either of these two options again. And then I'm also being asked to approve an option which I have no funding on. Note option one, which is the advantage, which is the option that has been promoted to us, 
notes that there is a formal dedicated program of work requiring additional resourcing, including personnel and financial, and will involve contributions of time and effort from a wide range of DCZ and IRC. Note the exclusivity of that staff. Um, where's the dollar? What's the cost? Hey, eh? where's the structure? DCC may have well selected option one, but gee, again, haven't they passed their, their contribution to this city over the last 10 years in terms of creativity? Boy, oh boy, you're not going to get much. Um, I just want um, the public of Dunedin and particularly South Dunedin um, to petition both the DCC and the IRC, but particularly the DCC, um, to get the private sector involved and get central government involved here. If there was that sort of structure right at this, and we're not coming in four years later after the DCC and the IRC have knocked everything out, but if they were involved in confident of is that there'll be some sort of linear structure that people will just hold up their hands in horror for four years' time and say, we're not funding that. So I won't be voting for this. Sorry, Councillor Calvert Linscott. Um, I'm not as harsh as Councillor Laws, <laughs> but I won't be voting against this, but I won't be voting for it. I'm going to abstain. And the reason I'm going to abstain is that I don't understand it. I can usually read English all right, but when I put all the words together, it's like trying to understand what Leonard Cohen means. <coughs> <laughs> um, each sentence might make sense, or the words, and then you put it all together and it's com it completely doesn't take me anywhere. And if where it takes us, I have some sympathy for Councillor Law's position about getting central government in, and I see that, like in Christchurch when they're building a stadium, they have central government in straight away because they're wanting a quarter of the money from them or more if possible, and we're going to be wanting some money in from them, and so getting them in would be right. Um, but on top of that, the idea of having discussions round between our organisation and the DCC about whether one or other of us might want to buy some property or who might want to buy it or next door to whether it's strategic or things or that we can move on it straight away considering we haven't got our land and water plan and other things in place until the end of next year. Well, we'll have some of it notified by then. I just am not sure where it takes us, what it's doing. And then when I read the words, and I apologise because this is my lack of art, lack of reading, good reading, and not your lack of stringing words together nicely. But I just don't, um, don't know where it's going, who's involved, what it's doing, and what will likely come out of it. So I don't know what I would be voting for. So I'm not saying it's not a great idea, it might be, I just don't understand why it would be. Okay, Councillor Scott. Sure. Um, I mean, this whole South Dunedin thing, it seems to me, has been putting along slowly for years. And, and this here is actually, uh, I believe, is a significant and a positive step forward. In, in reply to some of the comments that other councillors, my councillor laws talks about central government. Of course, central government are going to be involved. But what this plan says is that first we need to establish a climate change strategy. We need to do our local work, our local thinking, and based on the central government NPS and direction for the type of work and expectations in these areas that's been referred to. So central government will be involved but first, and at this time, we need to get our act together in relation to cost. My understanding is the costs were articulated, that it was in the order of a million dollars split roughly 50-50, if I misunderstood that. So that's pretty clear as well, and that's, that's been presented. Um, in terms of the recommendations, you know, I'm, I'm really heartened, like, by recommendation number eight, but also the continued collaboration with the DCC and the IORC. At last... You know, there's some recognition that we're moving forward together on this really significant issue. So I'm really heartened by that. And I also note the recommendation before that, uh, recommendation seven, where it says endorses the proposed 
uh, governance and management arrangements, noting that these arrangements may need to be revisited in the future, including following the local government elections. And that was as per the previous report to Councillor Calvert. So I think, you know, we're in sync there. Um, one thing I do disagree with, though, is the inference, and maybe I picked it up wrong, that, that South Dunedin won't necessarily be a plan in itself. Um, it'll be a little bit more ad hoc. Um, yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with integrating into our business, but I'd be surprised if there's not some type of plan in terms of South Dunedin, because I think it's going to take that type of plan as well as the strategy to pull in central government, as some councillors have alluded to. So we can basically say, this is our vision, this is our overall sort of plan, this is what it's going to cost, and this is what we expect their contributors to be involved in. And, and as Council Law said, it, you know, central government is going to have to be right in there at that point um, and involved. So I don't see it as an ad hoc thing that just sort of organically sort of grows. We, we need a plan. Like if, and where do we need to look for an example? We just look no further than, say, Christchurch, where Christchurch has got a plan and yeah, step by step, for example, you know, one part of the plan, unfortunately, near the end, you know, is the stadium. And, the, you know, so they're rationalising the stadium debate. Are they going to spend 650 million or whatever it is? But there's still that overall plan and the stakeholders and the process and the vision and the priorities. And once you have that plan, opportunities like Forbury Park will just fall out of it because we've identified as opposed to it coming along and, and being forgotten about. But just going back to the start, I'm really heartened by a lot of the stuff that's going on. I'm really heartened that you said that in two years' time, we should be in a material position to impact on opportunities as they present themselves. We've been sitting on our chuff for that long. I actually am starting to, believe it or not, Believe it or not, I'm starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. The train about to hit me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Forbes. Thank you. I, I didn't have um, any problems with this, and I thought it was um, a really good stepped program, and I can see what where you're trying to go, and I think that's the right way to do things. Uh, you've got three core work streams, exactly. Community engagement, environmental investigations, and monitoring and identification of risks. Uh, and then you want to get some interventions in there to help mitigate short term risk. You've already had 80 hui around the place. People have already been talking about this. Communities wants to keep talking about it, as far as I can tell. Uh, you put together a framework that is there to navigate really super complex issues. This isn't a complicated problem, which we just go at, it's a complex issue. Paragraph 15, can't remember what it said now, but it seemed very important at the time about how you're going to do this with your, I think it was nine steps or something like that. And to me, it looks like good sense. And I think um, that when the, the, the private sector, there is nothing to stop from getting involved today if there's a dollar to be made. If there's not, they won't. It's like that. Uh, I do agree with um, uh, getting government in and government funding in as soon as possible, but... A primary concern for Dunedin and the South Dunedin that I understand, and it's not a community I'm terribly involved with, is they want to be in charge of their own future. They don't want government coming in and telling them what to do. And, um, and, and government does have a way of doing that if they're coming up with the cash. So I think you're right on the money and I'm voting for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Noon, then Malcolm. I have a question first. Um, yeah, well, I guess. Yeah. Just a, po a, 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 po a point of clarity. Point of clarity. Oh, so, uh, just quickly to Dr. Palmer, under disadvantages, uh, formal dedicated program work requires additional resources. So, what effect is this going to have to my current annual plan? Or have we covered it in our annual plan? Yeah, option marks fully provide for the current yeah. annual plan. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you Thanks, Madam Chair. I was going to address that and um, uh, that LTP funding is, um, is is all covered. But I think the key thing with this is that uh, it's a step forward. Uh, the program uh, plan provides uh, certainty and some confidence. 
uh, to the people who either um, live or own property in South Dunedin, uh, people who have businesses in South Dunedin, own commercial property in South Dunedin. I think this um, helps them to plan their future, uh, knowing that uh, the councils are working together um, in a genuine partnership to try and provide um, greater confidence about the future in South Dunedin. I think we all believe it's got a great future, but it can have even a better future um, if we work in a, uh, a collaborative uh, way going forward. Sure, we've got to weigh up the risks. And um, as I think Council Hope mentioned about um, uh, opportunities, uh, realising opportunities, I'm sure there will be um, opportunities, but we need to take a, a, a cautious approach um, with regards to um, the challenges that we've got. A couple of other points. Um, from ORC's perspective, we said at the beginning of this triennium that we wanted to show greater leadership uh, in some, uh, well, across the region, but uh, South Dunedin popped up as one of those um, areas where we should be shoulder to shoulder with the city. And this, this uh, proposal in front of us um, helps to achieve that. In terms of the city, um, and this is, um, I have to respond to Council Laws' comment about um, uh, the city not having any money. Um, it's interesting to note that they're investing 36 million uh, in um, flood um, uh, mitigation works over the next 10, 10 years. years. Over 10 years? Right. Sorry. Well, Thanks. well, hang on. Have I got the floor? Well, we haven't got it, but anyway. Yeah, Might have a thank you, Councillor. No one you can continue. Okay, $36 million over 10 years in the LTP. Thanks. They're also uh, committed to a $12 million uh, library uh, as well investment. Uh, they've also committed to the St. Clair, St. Kilda Coastal Plan uh, project. So there's considerable investment going in um, from the public sector. You've only got to drive around South Dunedin and see the, um, either the redevelopment of some of the older dwellings or the redevelopment of some of the uh, uh, businesses in the main street or commercial property in the main street. The private sector is investing in South Dunedin as it is. And the challenges that exist uh, with regards, regards to high groundwater, the interaction on a daily basis with, with uh, the tides, with, with the groundwater, reminds me of a story that Richard Walls told me many moons ago. He used to live in Prince Albert Drive, and he always used to say his parents could never grow uh, root vegetables in the garden because the seawater was too high. Now, um, or the groundwater was too high. And that's just an example. This problem hasn't popped up. Um, for example, the challenges in South Dunedin overnight has been, been there for a long time. And the point I'm trying to make is that the community in South Dunedin have been able to live with the challenges they have um, had over many, many years. Sure, that, that may get more challenging with more and increased rain uh, events, et cetera. Um, however, I think that this plan certainly gives, as I said at the start, um, it doesn't give all the answers now, but it takes us in a direction uh, to find those answers and it gives us certainty and confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Allison. Jono, uh, your fire alarm just went off again, so I hope you can hear me. Yeah, thanks, Edward. Right. Look, yes, no, I'm I'm very encouraged by this paper. And do su I will su support the recommendation. I think it's the direction of travel is good. South Dunedin has been waiting for a long time for um, some constructive framework like this. Uh, and I notice it's really a dynamic, adaptive planning pathway, which is necessarily under the climate change scenarios we face. So look, um, I appreciate all the various comments and positions on it, but uh, South Dunedin has been very close to my heart for a long time and it really does require the, the two councils, I think, to take a lead on this. Uh, there are many other partners to put play to it, but uh, I think it's the responsible thing to uh, move forward on this. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson. 
just to my right of reply. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry, oh, we've got more speakers before I reply. Oh, sorry, 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 I didn't sorry, realize sorry, that sorry, it was, was, oh, geez, sorry. I didn't catch that, but sorry. Councillor Callagher and then Deca. Thank you, I'll be really quick. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna reluctantly support it. I'd hoped we'd be further ahead. There has to be more collaboration between DCC and ORC. Uh, this is a slow step, possibly in the right direction, but you, th there isn't really even a funding framework for those opportunities, those purchase opportunities, or knowing what the overall plan is of why you would take up those purchase opportunities, uh, or what the end outcome or result is likely to be, and what you'd hope to see there. So if I was a South Dean resident, either commercial or residential, I'd still be left in limbo for quite some time yet as to what you'd invest in or look to do into the future. So, um, yeah, I think uh, the only way forward is to support the, the slow step forward as opposed to a quick one. And central government has to become involved in the substantial funding required of that overall plan that hopefully will be arrived at in the next triennium that hasn't been arrived at in this one. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Callagher. Councillor Decker. Yeah, thanks, Gretchen. I... Uh... I'll be supporting the motion. <clears throat> I thank uh, Jonathan for the uh, excellent paper, uh, some of which we've seen before, but putting it all together like this around some uh, very thorough recommendations, I think is admirable. I don't share the, the sneering cynicism of some uh, about the competency of DCC and ORC. I think this is a good framework, good progress, um, and the last thing we want is a opportunity for a Jerry Brownlee type figure to come in and say, I'm the Minister for South Dunedin's recovery, I'll take over. Everybody stand back and see what a complete shambles that government made of the recovery of Christchurch because central government moved in far too quickly with almost a bullying approach. It's the last thing we want. I'm reassured from Jonathan's comments that Central government, of course, is well informed, is poised, is interested and committed to whatever happens in South Dunedin. But the locals must maintain local control over local issues. And this paper gives us the opportunity to do that. Thank you. I'll be in support. Okay. <clears throat> Councillor Malcolm, are you speaking now? Yeah, I'm just speaking yeah. to it now. Um, look, uh, I really listened to the comments of uh, Council Laws uh, in big disagreement because at the moment uh, this will join uh, the two together, but we have what we call a programme manager who ever since Mr Rose come on board, we've, we've seemed to get some semblance of order of where we're actually heading. So, yes. uh, look, I, I, yeah, look I'm, I'm very comfortable with supporting it, comfortable providing that we do get the communication right with the community. We, work, we continue to work hard on that, and it's driven by the community, and, and you'll get your best results. So, yeah, no, well done. Keep it going. Thanks, Councillor Malcolm. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for earlier on for um, answering all our questions as well, as well as Jean Luc and Dr. Palmer here. Um, yeah, from my perspective, it is a quantum leap forward from where we have been as councillors um, from ignoring um, true underlying issues in South Dunedin and around um, basic human needs and quality of life. Uh, we have some of the least services in those area in that area for per um, density of housing, particularly in terms of natural space or green space for others as well, um, through, I guess, fear of adapting, which we all feel, don't we? Um, we? We haven't grasped onto opportunities to actually improve and do that in a fair way. And the strategy is absolutely outlining that those are the core values. So, it's wonderful to see that and wonderful to see that the DCC are embracing a partnership with the ORC on this and that we're both investing um, into that already. My favourite, uh, one of the strategic objectives is that climate change impacts our fear. It's a just transition. So when we think about South Dunedin, it's actually all of Dunedin. You know, it's, you can't separate it off and think, oh yeah. 
that's over there by itself. It actually affects all of Dunedin. So it needs to be fair and recognise who's actually benefiting and who's actually um, taking some parts as well. So that's really important. The dynamic adaptive pathway um, creates certainty where there is certainty and recognises that there's uncertainty in a really complex um, scenario there and adapts. But where we can create certainty, we need to, and that's what it does. And it's a we, and when I say we, it's community and partnership with us. And that's a process that we're familiar with in other areas as well and works well. So that's all good. I have a lot of, actually, I'm finding I have quite a lot of sympathy for um, Councillor Laws and what he said and understand why he's voting the way he is as well. Um, it makes absolute sense for us to be teaming up with central government. Um, but in a timing sense, I've listened to what Jonathan said as well. And I've actually listened to what QLDC did as well in terms of the approach that they took through the briefing. And I asked that question and um, exactly around what's the timing for that and what's the nature of why, because they definitely say it was the way to go. Uh, but how does that work? It's through concrete projects that they've developed and then developed partnerships with um, central government yes. through. So it is a timing thing, I think. And I think that's what you said earlier on as well, Jonathan. Um, it's not too far away from us having concrete projects, I don't think. And we and all the way through that we need to be communicating, but the initial partnership is with local government and the community. And we also recognise that come the new triennium, we need to revisit what the governance structure is. That makes sense at that time too. But hey, this is a really, really good step forward. And um, thank you to the DCC for the ongoing coordination as well and the great work that you've been doing, um, Jonathan and team. Uh, and I really liked that you've recognised there's a whole lot of inputs we've already done as well, you know, both of us. And it's not reinventing that. It's not saying, gee, we've been mucking around for years doing a whole lot of work. The dynamic adaptive planning pathway brings all that in and we're actually at a hit and go um right now it's not a waiting for four years to do something the plan starts now which is brilliant so thank you very much for everything today okay we've got a mover in a second haven't we um and we can have a right of reply so Kate, would you like your right of reply yeah i would look i i get frustrated with people not voting because they can't get everything they want when in fact actually this is the only thing that's being offered up as a first step um, I think it's really unfortunate that I didn't notice when we had our pre-agenda meeting that these, this paper and 7.1 should have gone side by side. Mm -hmm. um, for me, 7.1 and why we, um, I was very happy to second Hillary's motion on the ESG, uh, or the executive steering group, whatever it was, is that come the end of the, um, the training, the new, going into the new training, I don't want to have a story in the front page of the ODT about which person is cross about not being on the spitting. That is something that I'd be expecting was happening behind the scenes and having really good relationships and, and growing good relationships um, so that they feel very really confident to get, come on and join something that isn't called just something called future Dunedin's or development strategy, but it actually has a persona and has a clear goal. If we want to do future development of Dunedin and have a strategy, that is going to incorporate and the needs that come out of South Dunedin as well. And they have to be actually joined up with these two papers. So um, while this is one discrete piece of work, it has to have a, a future focus as well. Um, and getting people on board, whether it's Karanga Ora or um, ministers of housing or um, uh, infrastructure, um, companies, we need to be in that place, seeing what opportunities there are along with Mana Penua, because I think that they can offer some really interesting but, and, uh, opportunities and perspectives on what this land used to be like and could be like again. Um, I'm really excited by that, but we don't need to have that as an argument here today. What central government has given us to date is a required for, uh, planning framework. That in itself is very valuable, as you can see from the developing this work. Mm -hmm. And we should actually accept that as part of the conflict so far. 
I am nervous about the costs. I'm nervous about how we don't have a policy when we get to these things that we instantly know how we're going to, or when that becomes a discussion as to who pays. Um, because is it a Dunedin good? Is it a Otago good? I don't know, because we're certainly not consistent about that across rates generally. Um, I think that's something I've been going on about for a few years. Um, we need to fix that. We need to give that sort of some high level governance uh, so a, a, a focus at some stage, but I'll leave that to the co chairs of finance to bring that up at, at a suitable time. Um, if you're not happy about the membership here, don't vote against it. Vote for it and say, how can we, and let's, let's spend the time before the next election working out how we can get the best membership in there. Don't just say no to it, please. Vote for it as a way at least to step forward. Otherwise, you're just um, you're showing no interest in these people having a future that they want to be part yeah, of. That's true. Yeah. Hmm. I think the debate's finished. Take the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. order. Thank you. Everyone can vote how they want to vote, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, we do have the recommendations there moved and seconded already in totality. Yep, so we've taken them all then at once. All in favour? Aye. 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 Against? No. Carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is three in the clock. Um, should we have a quick break? break no, break. no, we're staying a long time. We need to do this, you can. Uh, um, um, we've got a four o'clock meeting in theory. We're not going to do that. Alexa, how are we going to do our briefing? Up?
Thanks, everyone. Reconvening our meeting, and we're on to 7.1 Water Services Bill. Just recognising quite a few people need to go at about four o'clock. Thanks. How, how can that be true, Madam Chair, with the, with the um, agenda that we've got? Yeah, yeah how it is. We have others have been agended for another important meeting as well. Yeah, but how can that be true? Right? Well, it is. Right. So. Okay. We've got yep. a meeting on Friday, we need to get up speed. Which includes South and Order, we're on this meeting, thanks. Water Services Entity, Bill and Lisa Hawkins. Would uh, you like to outline this one quickly? Thank you, um, through you, Madam Chair. I'll keep this um, brief. Um, Warren Hanley, obviously, is an author of yeah. this report, but is unwell, so you have me. He's understand. online. He is online, so he will be there if you've got any um, questions. But effectively, this is a noting um, report to Council to let them know that the Water Services Bill um, has come out and there's consultation that closes on the 22nd of July. Mm. Um, staff have reviewed um, the bill, and I guess being consistent with um, ORC's input um, today is that we're generally um, supportive of the intent of this bill, but we do note that there's a little bit of um, ambiguity or um, um, it's not clear, I guess, as to the role of regional councils going forward, um, particularly from a perspective of where regional councils might need to be involved to provide a regional overview um, into the new water services entities around some strategic nature of water um, in our regions. And obviously um, the water service entity bill um, at area D is what we are involved in now, which obviously has three regions effectively in Canterbury, Cells and Environment South being involved. So um, what we are proposing is for staff to um, prepare um, a, a response to this, which basically, I guess, identifies that concern that there's not a clear role um, in the bill at the moment for regional councils, and that we think that's an important role we may need to play from a strategic perspective, but given the time of having to get um, a response in by the 22nd of July, we propose it would be a staff-led submission. Okay. Yeah, we seem to have um, 21st, 22nd July deadlines for all of these um, submissions. Mm. Thanks. Council Wilson. I have no problems with that being a part of the focus of the Regional Council submission. The question I have is, is it our role to reflect on our communities and their difficulty with some of the provisions and should we be supporting them? And the example I'm going to give you is my understanding that there are a number of smaller communities that have a gravity feed system at the moment that while they could add something at two or $3,000 to filter and UV treat their water, the requirements that I'm hearing about, and I'm, I can't put my finger on, but actually requires them to have a substantial tank and a pump in the system, which will put that cost up to twenty to thirty thousand dollars in some parts because of the power that will be required for needs of gravity systems to date. Are we reflecting that the law or the bill should reflect that something that is economically efficient and affordable? For our communities, or is that not our role as as a submitter? Because I know that there's, you know, we keep on talking about how we have to do submissions. The very same people who are doing the IB, the very same people who are doing the one for last week, are having to do this sort of matters as well. And we're not getting any context out or support for those communities for some of their very real costs. So sorry, that's a bit of a talk piece as well. But in that context, are we submitting along those sort of lines to reflect the concerns of our community? Um, um, can I just, um, Lisa, sorry, um, the, uh, the submission is really from an operational perspective, um, so we haven't taken that aspect, but we can add something in that talks about, um, you know, the ability of communities to actually access and implement and afford these types of systems if, if you want us to do that. It's not a problem to do that. Well, yeah, and that's, again, the process is because if we don't have the chance, we've given this today, to A, see the submission or to feed into those ideas, and maybe I should have done it in the last three days when I essentially had the report. I'm just not sure that the process is right. I would much prefer that we had a delegation to a couple of councillors and the chair, for example, who has a feel for these issues and can raise them and support the staff to protect the community submission as well. Right. There were any questions. Thanks. Well, that, that is a question. Would that be would that be able to be done? Looking in the time frame, could we establish a small 
delegation. Yeah, yeah. and do a whole of council submission as well. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And can I propose Gretchen and Kate as S S and P co chairs? Right, we'll get to that with a quick thanks, Councillor Calvert. The Ooh. question: Have we got enough time to do that? Uh, so just thinking through um, the time frame, um, it's due to be lodged on the 22nd, and I don't, don't even know which day of the week the 22nd is. Probably uh, Saturday. <laughs> yeah, it probably is on the weekend. It's Friday, so it's next Friday. Um, so uh, at the moment, as the re resolution stands, this would need to be with Pim by about next Thursday for him to sign off for Friday lodging, so that will require um, working getting that done between now and next Wednesday. Okay, thanks, that answered that. Council Laws. So can I ask a question? Uh, we are talking about 7.4, the Water Service Centre, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Because I, 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 we seem to be considering this issue like it's, oh, we're just going to concentrate on the details. Um, the bill, in actual fact, in fact, the recommendation is that uh, notes that staff will make a staff submission, so we're not going to make a submission at all, uh, anticipating that there might be one. But then it says, if I take it to uh, the, the, the staff submission is actually, uh, here it is, clause 47. Anticipating that the bill will pass, it will not directly ORC, impact ORC's function and operations. That's fair enough. So it's really nothing to do with us, really. It's a peripheral. It's out, out there somewhere. But then it goes on to say, overall, ORC is supportive of the objectives of three water reforms, as signalled in ORC's 2021 submission to the Department of General Affairs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not aware of us ever having a policy discussion around this particular table, ever, on the three waters reform process, ever. So I, I can't, the, the idea was, this is the staff submission on the technical aspects of the bill. That's completely different than the policy issue, which is, is this three waters reform fit for purpose and a good thing? Boy, I have some very strong views on that, but I've never been asked it. I've only ever been asked, and we're only asked to think, if this goes through, what are the technical features? These are the ways you can improve it from a technical point of view. But I have never, ever been questioned, and neither does the ORC have any policy on whether three waters is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not sure so, this is a question. No, 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 well, it is, because at the moment, the paper that's come before us says it's supportive of three waters reform. And I'm sorry, but season, I'm, we've never had that. We've never had that. Objective doesn't oh. take a position. No, it's not what it says here. What, which Look at clause 47. Clause 47. Under legislative and risk considerations, it's the second error, second sentence. Can I just clarify, Council Laws? That should say OSC staff. Apologies, that's been missed out. Well, when did you guys get together and make a policy decision? On this. No, the submission, it wasn't a policy decision. We'll just, we did, I'm just trying to track down the submission from last year for you. Um, but it's, it's about the, it was about the impact on, um, apologies, just, um, on how it, it, it affected our functions and operations as opposed to being a policy decision that could have been reworded. Well, let me get this right. ORC staff don't have positions on policy. ORC staff have positions on operational issues. So if this legislation goes through, how are these technical things going to be worked out? That's what ORC staff have. ORC staff do not have views on policy. At that point, you draw yourself into direct and absolute conflict with governance. It's governance that determine whether or not something is going to be of policy relevance and have a view as an organisation on policy. You don't have one wing of ORC hiving off and saying, listen, we support this policy. It, doesn't, it says the objectives, it supports the objectives. It doesn't policy. make it, you've just heard the clarification. The ORC staff are supportive of the Three Waters Reform. No, of the objectives of the Three Waters Exactly, reform. that's a policy issue. If you have a look at the objectives, they are in clause 13 of the bill, yeah. Brian, and they are clearly a political or policy statement. 
plus the yeah. question council. So what I'm trying to say is I want it very, very clearly clear. Well, two things clarified. One, OSC policy haven't made a policy decision on three wards reform. That's the first thing that we need to clarify. And the second is that this staff submission relates to the technical and functional aspects of the water entities bill. And the services entities bill. Yes, that's right. And I want that clarified in the motion we passed and what we're doing. And our OSC staff put the submission in. This is to say, if you're going to go ahead with this, these are ways of you could technically improve this, or these things need to be clarified. Not as in great idea, which at the moment this paper says. Thanks. I can see that Tim has his hand up too, so maybe he would like to answer this. Is this right? Oh, oh thanks, uh, Gretchen. Thanks. Uh, look, um, I'm sorry if I missed this because it did come to me, I think, Anita, but I agree with uh, Michael on this. Uh, my view is. This wasn't something for staff to make a decision on. Can um, can okay. I suggest a, a councillor Calvin? Sorry, didn't want to interrupt, but can I suggest to help councillor Lord out <coughs> that we could, um, with one of those recommendations, forget about whether for a moment whether two of us could join the staff, but could we note that? That 47 yeah. has been now clarified, and that is not what it said, what they actually did. Well, whatever it was that they did, our staff did actually do. They I could, think it needs could, to be clarified yes. clearly. That's what I'm saying. Put the in there, we note council, that. Neither yeah. staff nor policy has a position on the objectives of three water reform. That any submission that we place is related to the technical application of the bill were it to proceed in its current form. And we need to clarify that in a motion because at the, motion, at the moment, you don't read a motion separate from the accompanying documentation. We all know that. What does the motion mean? Read the documentation. At the moment, that documentation is contrary to what both the chief executive and I believe this government's team would wish to have. Could you say that again to Di so she can write down it as part of a motion? Um, just double check. Um, okay, that's cool. Actually, you could form up your recommendation, um, your motion, and then we can have finalised questions. Yep. We can take an adjournment as well if it's yeah. going to help with um, thinking all that. No, we, I just think the motion would read. Do you want to write that down and get the adjourn and do that? Um, I think Michael says he's pretty ready to go. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the motion would read that the Otago Regional Council had no policy position on three waters reform. Mama? Have never had. Well, we have no. And that any staff submission will relate to the technical aspects. Of the water services entities bill. Uh, Councillor Scott, is this a question? Yeah, it's just <clears throat> it's just in relation to uh, Councillor Laws. Look, I, I accept where Councillor Laws is coming from in terms of differentiating between staff and governance responsibilities, but as a matter of interest, I googled what the objectives of the three waters are, because that's what the statement says. I always say support of the objective three waters reform. And what it says is safe, reliable drinking water, better environmental performance with wastewater and stormwater services, efficient, sustainable, resilient and accountable multi-regional and sewage services, making it affordable for future generations. I'm not surprised that we're supportive of those objectives. Can I answer um, that? Yeah. If, if I got well, the wrong, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because is, can I yeah. just point out to Councillor Scott that the operating principles of the Water Services Bill are in clause 13. Sorry, the operating, operating principles. No, no, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about okay. the objectives. That's what it says is the yeah, objective. But, right, yeah, we're getting into a debate on objectives yeah, and council laws is put it. Yes, okay, but you're um, debating rather than asking a question. 
and Councillor Laws has already said what he thinks his record, well, what his motion is. So that's good. I will right, second this. Somebody want to second it? I'll yeah. second. Okay, let's go into debate on it then now. Anyone want to say anything further? Councillor Calver. I wanted to ask whether, um, in light of that, whether it, it, the, we should add a resolution or I, it's appropriate for me to add a resolution um, saying that the two of you would help Thank do something that goes away next Friday. Cool. Is, is that appropriate or is it, um, are we in the light of what we're just saying? Be that it is a whole of council yeah, submission and it. then yours becomes void yeah. and it all gets quite confusing yeah. because we right. won't know what our joint posi political position mm -hmm. is on anything else. Exactly. So okay, I think so perhaps it... This is just a staff mm -hmm. submission that well, we're being advised on the technical aspects of the bill and that if there's anything in there that is not one of those, it should take, be taken out as a that submission by yeah. our staff. That is correct. That's it, some of us, <laughs> yes. Uh, and yeah. Pim is nodding, so yes. yes. Yeah. Um, that's nice and simple. Yeah. Okay. I, I have nothing more to say. No one else, oh, sorry, before you write a reply, which is that? Anyone else want to say anything? If, if you could just reread it. Councillor Scott, yes. oh, yeah. sure. okay. If you could you just reread it. it so that. How about the Bible? Yep. <clears throat> And you can check if you want to debate it further, but we're moving on, I think. And we, Pim understands that yeah. um, the staff submission will not include any of that. We all understand that, that's yeah. good. Yep, right, no one seems to be putting their hand up to debate further, so. We got a mover and a second. Uh, Councillor Calvert, you seconded, didn't you? Yes. Yep. Okay. All in favour? Aye. 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 Carried. Right. Next one is the um, Indigenous Biodiversity Proposed National Policy Statement. Um, Warren and Tom were co-authors on this one. Tom, would you like to kick us off? Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for you, Madam Chair, uh, I'll, I'll take the paper as read. Now, I'm happy to answer any questions, but it might be useful uh, for some to kind of give a, a, a very, very brief overview of what this is about. Again, it's again uh, another um, exposure draft mm -hmm. that was released in June. Um, we've got four pieces of legislation uh, that were released in that month and we've got to submit on these or we've been given an opportunity to submit on these. Um, the submission period closes on the 22nd or the 21st, sorry, which is next Thursday. MFE have uh, specifically asked to comment on workability. They're not really interested in um, feedback on a high level princes, uh, pr principles. <coughs> um, from our point of view, um, we uh, think that there could be some benefit <coughs> in uh, clarifying the provisions that set out obligations to regional councils. Uh, we've got a plan, um, some work in the context of the NPS IB um, clarifying exactly what the scope is of that work would help us to um, budget for it as well, uh, would en enable us to um, make sure we've got good staff resources as well. Examples of that uh, are that we have to support TAs when they're identifying um, SNAs or TAs can ask us for support, um, but it doesn't really specify what type of support uh, or, or to what extent we have to go. Um, also, we've been asked to identify, for example, um, areas of highly mobile fauna, but it doesn't really clarify, clarify um, whether that applies to uh, the entire region or uh, only to um, natural areas, whether it includes urban areas as well. Um, it also sets out a, a process of collaborating with stakeholders and IWI. Uh, when uh, drafting up regional strategies. And um, the staff position is it would be better if we have some flexibility around that um, because that would allow us to 
uh, fitted in with existing processes that we have with the community or our partnership with EWE. Um, yeah, so those are essentially like the, the key concerns really. Uh, another concern is um, we want to make sure that it's properly aligned with other legislation. Um, a lot of the management of um, natural areas, wetlands for example, is a, is a good example where uh, it is dispersed between the NPSFM and the NPSIB. Um, so bringing that together and ensuring better consistency is something that we would uh, request central government to do. Thank you. Um, sorry, Councillor Calva. Um, was that an invitation to speak? Um, sorry, I paused. Yeah, I was just <laughs> thinking about something else at that moment. Um, um, questions? Just, I like where you're going with it in general. I'm just wondering whether you could remove, according to Councillor Law's unhappinesses, um, any time when it says is supportive of the intent of, like yeah. in part in 21 and 22 supports the intent of this policy, whatever. If you just go through and sanitise. Can, can I just add though, Councillor Calvert, you, um, Council have made a submission on the MPSIB in terms of policy direction. And this, yeah. this submission now is about the technical aspect. So you have taken yes. a position on the MPSIB no, in the no, past. Thank you. Because I, I appreciate that, but because this is a staff submission and it says ORC, it should be the technical part because it's the staff, the ORC staff submission. Um, because it's about the technical things. So I'm just saying there's no need to have those, we support the intent of bits in there. They don't. Yeah add anything much up. So I'm just saying, could you just predict them? Councillor Wilson. Um, I'm not happy. Uh, <coughs> sorry. The problem we've got at the moment with the Indigenous biodiversity, I'm really amazed that we didn't talk about ICM at all in your work, because if we want to progress into our catchment management, and we want to progress riparian planting, and we want to progress a whole lot of projects like the MFE, uh, MFE one that the council was involved in, in the Pleasant River, or in um, Te Akamene Toto, or any of those other MFE projects. They require more than just fencing of waterways. They require planting and everything else. Those, um, the keenness of the community to be involved in these is one, us identifying what the values are and the um, indigenous biodiversity that could be at special in people's areas, but also the carrot at the end, which everyone had understood until the climate commission came out recently, and um, with the um, Hewaka Ekanoa, and have said don't account for that as carbon credits. Now, the problem at the moment is we've got a whole lot of policy happening, and it's creating a void, and actually taking away the carrot, the one carrot that has been there. Um, and no one is messaging this. Well, individuals are having to message this. This is exactly what leadership should be from this council table. And no one is mentioning it or trying to tie up this whole thing of what it looks like. And how do you get to that end point that it has some wins for everyone in it? Um, you know, the poor people in the upper tire who cannot grow trees to five metres unless they irrigate them just simply by their climate and therefore can't do anything about their um, carbon footprint. Is that, this a question? It is a question. In that context, I'm trying to say, is, do we have a role, as I asked in the last one, in, re, in that bigger picture of how do all of these policies work for our communities so that we get the best at environmental outcomes? Because doing that on the technical issues and leaving it as just on the stuff, I'm thinking is going to have absolutely no benefit because no one is trying to bring these policies together. Uh, that's a decision for us, isn't it? Well, no, listen, I'm asking staff. It, okay. it doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, um, through you, Madam Chair, I do think that um, the, the, the exposure draft, um, it talks about the development of regional uh, biodiversity strategies, mm -hmm. and that is probably a, a vehicle to accomplish that, to bring that all together and, and include um, uh, yeah, those non-regulatory approaches and support mechanisms. 
so the well the, the question is would you support plantings riparian plantings would you be putting in this if we want to get to that point of having indigenous biodiversity the best way of that is having some more levers or tools that recognize plantings under one point uh, under five meters for the point of, of carbon um, sinks and that's the problem at the moment we don't have a lever that does that and i don't know where the government's going to go on the climate commission um recommendation on that well there's a huge gap that's, oh, that's, 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 that's a policy direction yeah. though councillor wells and that would be quite hard yeah. for staff to are we able promote. are we able to have a resolution for a brief governance submission along the lines of what councillor wilson wants um you can have any motion Is, yeah. would that be Very useful not, really um yes um, you had your hand up before you so, sorry you've got you're just eating now that's yeah. the worst time to <laughs> and you have your hand up now but i, I was just going to say while pim's getting his mic ready there's that um emma Fair explicitly asked not for any comments on the policy they only want the workability it's not to say you can't do it um but i don't know how much traction it will get when they've explicitly said that it's not what they're looking for so it's up to you thanks anita yes so my hand up was earlier was up a little bit earlier <clears throat> just because there was uh i think hillary was trying to compare this uh, to something that happened just a moment ago but i didn't necessarily see the comparison because anita was quoting an orc position which is okay so, so just to clarify my position, I'm, I'm not really very keen on staff submissions at all, frankly, because the risk of a staff submission is then you presumably could have a council submission, which would be different from the staff submission. It doesn't make sense to me. So my, my preference would be always to have an ORC submission, and I'd rather let the delegation was to the chair or somebody else um, to support staff with that submission. Um, but, but if you're going to have a staff submission... <laughs> I don't have a problem with the staff quoting an agreed position from the council, as long as that position has been agreed previously. Uh, I think I think the, the issue that Councillor Laws raised earlier was that it wasn't actually an agreed position, and and therefore I wouldn't want a staff submission saying something which council might have a different view on. In light of that, um, if I may just follow up oh, again, yeah, put those threads together. To um, since Anita has advised us that what they actually want is technical advice anyway, then there's no harm in leaving out anything about policy and the, the submission that's made anyway, because it's just requesting technical stuff. So That's true, Hilary, but it's still my view that, you know, staff are allowed to put into their submission something that the council has clearly agreed on. Yes. If, it's a, if, if it's a previous vote and it's a previous policy, it's not harm, harmful. I, I think they are. I'm just saying in this case, yep. if it's not a policy thing. No, if, if it's not a council policy, we shouldn't be telling uh, the public through a submission that it, that it is one. Council staff. Just, just make, just want to support Kate, actually. It's not, I, I know from a practical perspective, um, it's not just about growing, the ability to grow native trees to five metres. It's also a width constraint of 30 metres. There's some practical things there, but I think the key point that Kate is making, isn't it, that if you want to uh, support uh, mm -hmm. the planting of native plants, then um, the carbon policy needs to be integrated and fit for purposes as well. Yep. And at the moment, this is the only door that's still working And, on and maybe a paragraph yeah. simply saying that, what the heck, would be appreciated. I would support Kate in that. But staff would need to consider that and whether they felt that yeah. was technically something that they wanted to submit on. But an alternative would be, as Kate said in the earlier paper, would be to appoint some people to assist and to create a whole of council submission. Uh, so we need, would need to get, to get well, to see the submission, I suppose, and to agree and add anything oh, yeah. uh, by Wednesday, I think. I'd make it a one staff council submission. Yeah, that's the idea. So there's that. There's like, but we need to move that. I'm happy to move that, that there be a one yeah. staff councillor and ORC submission. I've got his hand up. I just before oh. you move anything, I want to just make sure he's not. Urgent waiting to say more. No, look, I, I, I agree with what, what I think um, Hillary's about to say, which is an no. OIC submission. Should, 
<laughs> ORC submissions should be from the whole of ORC. I, I don't know why there would be any, any other sort of submission because it sort of suggests that there might be a staff position which differs from the council position, and that should actually never happen. So, okay, sorry, thank you. Yeah. So, so my resolution would be that we lodge a an ORC submission that um, it is as described in this paper with the addition of um, whether or not they want to hear about them with the addition of whatever and do we want two people or one I don't care De delegate the submission yeah. item two yeah delegate this the submission additions that the councillors are concerned about to Kate and Gretchen to work with staff. To work with, and you can, to, to work with staff to yeah. produce that, yeah. that whole of whole of organisation submission. Yeah. And whether or not they want to take any central government wants to take any notice of the fact that we've gone beyond the technical, that's fine. Have we got some words? No, we need some more help. Lodge, oh, sorry, lodge an ORC submission that it is possessed. <laughs> as described yep. in the paper with the addition of Councillor Robertson and Wilson. Mm. Oh, yeah, I could say three worked, but yeah. yeah. Councillor Robertson and Wilson to be, to work with staff. To provide input. To develop a whole into, council yeah. submission yes. in line with this paper. Or, in line with this discussion. Yeah. Question of Tom. So this, um, what, what the ministry is saying, they're looking for for submissions based on the workability and the technical side of things. So we're simply saying, as a, as our position, is that it actually won't work because you have not allowed. Yeah, that, I, I think what, what we're trying to get in can be put yeah. into that framework. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it, Do have, Abby? Through you, Madam Chair. Yes. Right. Well, what we're saying is it would work better. If, for example, you did this and that, make it better aligned with other uh, national direction, yeah. Yeah. clarify what our roles and responsibilities are. Um, yeah. yeah. That's good. Tom. Th thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sounds great. Have I got a second? We need it. Yes, I was about to say that. Yes, I am. Yes. 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 So, have we got a second? No, <laughs> Councillor Scott, brilliant. That is a record. Those two agreeing at that stage. She, she abused me in the spider and can't put the photos in the same sentence. You can. We've so just done that. So that's good. We so all of the rest of the same. Well, well, the same sentence. I'm Goodness. about to um, read it out again to ensure everyone knows what they're debating now. Yeah. Are you going to put it up? Good. That's yeah. Second. That's cool. Oh, no. She's just um, deleted no, the whole lot. It's coming back. Give me one moment. Thank you. It's coming. Okay. Lodge and OIC submission as described in the paper with the addition of Councillor Robertson and Councillor Wilson to work for staff. Oh, so wasn't it just Councillor Wilson? Kim Robertson and Wilson to work with staff to develop a whole of yes. council submission. So the first bit could go. Put four into two oh. or yeah. whatever. Sorry. Yeah. So all of that first bit before Councillor Robertson could go. Mm. Well, oh, okay, just so much. And then yeah. pop it into two. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Right. So, so mm. we need a read in the strategy and planning committee. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, and then it would take out staff from two. Approves the lodgement of a submission signed by the Council Chief. Robinson and Wilson are approved to, and yeah. are appointed to work with our yes. Yeah. Can I ask Thomas question? Oh, yeah. Yes, we'll allow that. Well, you, keep yeah. getting, you keep getting it right. Tom, oh, just just yeah. on um, on number thirty three, current budgets. You've got current budgets and move plans do not anticipate assisting territorial or authorities on mapping and identifying SNAs. So, so the question about that. So if if I take you ring you up, 
and say, well, actually, I need, I need a hand to do that. Do we just go and do it, or, or have we got cost recovery? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, Warren, you might have to, um, you can maybe correct me, but to my recollection, there is no cost recovery clause included in the draft exposure and the exposure draft of the NPSRB. It just as a simple statement um, that um, TAs can request assistance from regional councils with identification of SMAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's no, that's right, Tom, there's no top cost recovery. It would be at our cost. It would be an unbudgeted and unplanned piece of work. So, so what would the option then be? Like, I've got no, uh, I've got no budget to do that. You'll have to get a consultant, is it? Or uh, yes, we would okay. either have to. We would either have to. So I was just going to say, we'd either have to reprioritize another piece of work and stop doing something that we're doing, or come back to council or look for budget elsewhere. Um, yeah, cool. Yep. To do that. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> As a general rule of thumb, you don't go. You know, we're trying to get cost recovery. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what we've got to move around a second. Uh, any further questions at this point would have to be dealt with privately. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put it then. All in, yes. All in favour? Aye. 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 Carried. Thank you. Yep. We have. Yeah, okay. Summary of feedback. Um, Gretchen, Edward's got his hand up from that last paper. Oh, okay, sorry. Edward, have you got your hand up for a reason at this point? Yeah, I did. It's probably too late now. I had trouble with my screen again, but it was really um, clarifying that the paper that uh, staff had put up, there was no disagreement with the contents of, in that paper because there was questions over. Uh, yep, that's good. The, that's a good question, but we've just passed that it's in line with the paper. So, yep, good. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, 7.6 summary of feedback received and policy guidance from the, in, no, the region wide policy direction from our workshop. Yeah. Tom, are you going to be yep. uh, the person uh, here or Anita or how are we uh, going to do this? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy to kind of briefly... I'll let Tom go for now. Briefly yeah, introduce it. Um, thank you. Um, essentially what we've done here is um, over the period, I think September 2021 up until April, we had a series of workshops with councillors and EV representatives where we asked them about uh, asked them for guidance, policy guidance on a number of topics um, that would be included in, in uh, the new land and water plan. Um, on most topics, we um, came to a kind of a what we call a settled policy position, where EV representatives and, and councillors came to a, a common view. Um, but on the last workshop, staff asked us to. Um, uh, collect some further information on three topics. Um, one was around what is the management approach for industrial uh, discharges? Um, what is the overall approach towards the use of consent review processes versus consent durations, specifically short-term consent durations? And the third one was um, use of water storage in the context of renewable energy generation. So what we've done in the paper was just to come up with a, a recommended policy guidance derived from the feedback and the, the further investigations that we've done. And we would kindly ask you um, to either adopt it or we're happy to take further comments as well. Yeah, thanks. In light of the timing restraints, but also a good process here as well. I'm not sure whether we're going to need heaps of questions here. We're probably better to move something. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we can't if there's some cool, yeah. Well, I was just wondering, um, we're going to be rushed. Is, is it at a critical time we decide this today? Um, is it going to probably, affect, 
Probably not. Operationally going to affect you? No, we've got plenty to go by. So I was just wondering if, if you if wanted to save time, you could just put this to the council meeting or put it on the agenda for the council meeting and move on to the next item. Then you don't have Ed's input. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, if there's any input that you'd like to make, then invite him to do so. But I'm just saying, I'm just looking, I'm aware of the time you're off and Kate's off and stuff like that. And I'm thinking this is actually quite an important issue. It's not something you want to skimp over. Um, it's going to set our policy for it. Can we come back and have some proper yeah. time with it at, at a future council meeting? That's all I'm just, yeah. it's just a suggestion. Yes. Oh my so through you, Chair, the only, no. the only timing implication is we are, we need to pick yeah. off the region-wide provisions. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's a way that you can split the recommendations at all. Um, if we could have um, the noting um, recommendation and, and hold the other one over, I don't know if you can do that or not. Um, Maybe note the paper and then hold over recommendations. Or hold over yeah. recommendation three and recommendation three comes back to council and move the other two. I don't know if you can do that, but um, we just we need to start on the region wide engagement with our um, stakeholders. That's all. Uh, I'm like I'm like Councillor Malcolm. I've got a number of questions around this too, and I don't want to. Well, that tomorrow out. morning. We've got a no, meeting at nine, but we could do something late. Okay. Possibility. Initially, the paper was going to be presented to the governance group. Oh. We've got a. That's what I'm saying tomorrow morning. So it could go to council, full council. So what do you think? Go to the governance group tomorrow morning. Oh, the they can't group. make decisions. Though. The one I want to make go to another day would be the. Using consent reviews as opposed to consent yeah. duration. Yeah, I've got two that, or three. Yeah, that's exactly that right. area is yeah. the so, one I think we need yeah. a decent. We've had a proposal that we let it sit. Well, no, yeah, refer it to the council meeting. I guess is really it. Um, in terms of that, the also we have um, Edward and Lynn who are on this committee. And that was the governance structure that we determined, which was land and water governance group mm -hmm. through to this committee, through to council for good reason, um, and input. So valuable input throughout each of those stages. So um, hear what you're saying, uh, but we do need to give um, Edward a chance yeah. to talk. Um, if yeah, could we invite submissions from Edward and? Um, Lynn prior to the council meeting. We don't have a July council meeting. No, we don't have one until August. August. We've got an August mm. strategy. Oh, right. yeah. Is that the 10th of August? 10th of August. Yeah. That's, That's not long away. Right. No. Well, it depends on what the mm. so, We could do it now. We could do it tomorrow morning, adjourned. I've sent okay. you my main PowerPoint. Sorry, Yep, and we're trying to get, the question is around timing, and Tom said he didn't think it was critical, but it's quite critical if we don't have a July council meeting, so which gives us a lot less options and really does bring us back to needing to make the decision. If it's just, yeah. if it's just this one, and we provide, pr approve the others and left this one yeah. to lie for the next council meeting or whatever, yeah. would that get me away in a major fashion? So if, if, you got something to say, Anita? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say if you if you're only holding over recommendation three, which it sounds like the areas are are the ones you want to discuss, that's fine. We can bring the option three recommendations back to the next S and P because that will have the bulk of the policy direction that's in the noting recommendation sorted, and we can start the um, engagement on that stuff. So we could we could split it that way if that makes sense. Yes. So, move, so it's three C. Yeah. So move that. Um, Hang on, just yeah. That we we adopt recommendations one and two, and that item three lies on the table. Three A and B the next. So the next, the time frame. To the next council. S and P. Um, S and P. S and P. If you're wanting S and P. Yeah. S and P's tenth of August. And Anita's suggesting S and P. Okay. All right. So so that would be Nita, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'll second councillor. Yeah, council. council. Seconded by councillor. Yep, we've got three recommendations just waiting for that to be captured. So we're doing one and two and three. Three A and B. <laughs> three A and B. And C is. To lie on the table. To lie on the table. So the next two strategy policy. 
Yeah, it's true. It's 3A, B and C, isn't it? Well, it's not three. We're letting C lie as what we're saying till next time. Recommendation three. Three. Oh, all three. Lies on no three C. Recommendation three. Oh, okay. Well, then comes. Yeah, because it's all policy directions. We're not going to decide them all right now, are we? This is a lot you've agreed on, anyway, isn't it? That would have agreed on. This is the. Yes. This is the. Okay. Yeah. Are we able to see the other reports, Richard? Mm hmm. Yep, this is just this one, so we can get on with the other ones. <laughs> yep. All right, so that was cut to the law and public. Council Laws, yeah. Council laws yep, yep, and seconded Councillor Calvert. Any debate on this one? Just checking no one online wants to talk. No, okay then. Uh, we'll put all of those together. All in favour? Aye. Uh, against? <laughs> Carried. Thank you. Next one then. Report back on the first stage of FFU consultation for the development of the land and water plan. Oh, um, you're out right on sorry. nearly everything today. Um, to you, Madam Chair, uh, just a, a report to give you a bit of an overview of the past or first stage of consultation that closed, I think, back in April. Really what the report does is outline the purpose of that, the methods that we applied. Um, we also gave an overview of how many responses we got um, and uh, a bit of a stock take like the lessons learned. Uh, obviously that the methods that we applied during that consultation, um, if we can avoid it at all, um, we would broaden it up and, and uh, probably still keep an online component but um, complement that with in-person meetings going forward. Okay. Questions, Council Scott? Yeah, and I think that's what you just simply said in the report is that, you know, and depending on the COVID situation, yeah. there'll be a mix between online and person meetings as well as you can correct um there are some advantages in doing it online yeah um because you get standardized responses which makes it easy um it's time efficient um but obviously there's some constraints as well and i think just from a, a relationship building point with a community and with your stakeholders um it's probably um good to yeah, have traditional community meetings and person meetings as cool. well. Yeah, yeah. That's what you said by paragraph 32. Yeah. Any other questions? It's just a note in the report. I will report. Thank you. To make it Thank you. Thanks, Council yeah. Malcolm. Anyone want to talk further on it? No? Right. Thank you very much for that update. Ian, all in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Very good, thanks. Next one. Overview of approach and timing for future consultation stages. Yep. It's like a through you, Madam Chair. Um it's very much related to the previous report. The previous report was um looking back at the past. This is forward looking. And um Back in 2020, I think in May 2020, we presented a, a report to the um, SMP committee um, outlining our consultation approach with respect to um, FMUs. Um, at that point, we provided for two consultation stages. That was two years ago, and, and things have moved on a little bit. Um, and we thought it would be good to actually outline in a report uh, the current state of thinking and how we're going to progress FMU conversations, but also bring in um, a bit of an overview of how we're going to tackle um, engagement around developing the region-wide provisions, noting that there's a lot of interactions between the two. Um, so over the past couple of months, um, we saw the need to have uh, another round of FMU consultation. Um, 
and also we developed uh, some further thinking around engaging with key stakeholders on the regional wide provision. So we outlined it in that paper as well. Um, basically, what we're seeking from you is, is your endorsement of that approach. Questions, Council Laws and Scott. Just very, very quickly. So this consultation improvement will still allow us to meet all our requirements. Yes, part of the um, paper, what we tried to do was look at the requirements under the NPSFM and, and line them up with the different aspects and stages of the consultation and see whether we are actually meeting them. Also, um, after consultation one, we, we had to, almost last minute because of COVID, we had to change our approach. And uh, we wanted to uh, get some reassurance as to whether um, that approach or altered approach actually will stand up in court. So we asked, um, we went into a discussion with our legal support team as well, like, you know, just, yeah. yeah. So we included that review or, or uh, an overview of that discussion as well in an appendix. Yep, got that. Thank you. Can't stop. Um, it says notification has to go, occur by 31st of December, 2023. Has it always been December or was it yep. November? Um, December. End yeah. of November, so beginning of December. For you, Chair, it's always been December. Okay. Um, and specifically, this uh, third iteration, will it impact on that achieving that time, December 2023? Mm. No, it won't. Uh, you, Madam Chair, when you mean um, third iteration, is it the third step consultation step? Yeah. No, no, it mm. won't. Cool. And the final question, this, this, this third step, is, is, it, is there any double up with the work that the hearing panel will carry out following December 2023? No. No. Um, um, sorry. Can I just look back to one question, Councillor Scott, about the timeline? Um, the extra consultation step doesn't alter the timeline, but your note um, recommendation four, and that is the Ministry's Perifighton guidelines, which um, there's a paper going to governance group tomorrow that's going to directly address that. How do you mean directly address that? Impact on that? There are now timing issues, yes. Not as a result of the consultation, as a result of BMFE's guidance. Uh, Councillor Callagher, then Calvert. Thank you. Very quick question. Um, table on for items or clause 17. Um, why have the rural sector been excluded from landfills and cemeteries, given that farm landfills and silage and composting are included? Um, and then I suppose you could also ask the same question around stormwater and wastewater discharges if you're looking at long drop and composting toilets and um, some other issues with stormwater and wastewater that could apply to farm buildings. Um, look, we're happy to... Um to include those, um, yeah, probably a bit of an oversight on our on our behalf. Uh, it was just to give you a bit of a feel as to who we are going to consult with or engage with. Um, but yeah, happy to add those on to um, those topics, those stakeholder groups. Okay, great. Yeah, Thanks. I would just add to that, that one of the reasons we want you to have the table is for, to identify the bits where we might have inadvertently dropped people off. So that's useful. Thanks, Councillor Kelleher. Right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Calvert. Two things. The thing that Anita referred to a minute ago, can we have that? One of you's got a, the new template or the new something that you were going to present tomorrow. Can we have it today? Can we have it in the today's? You were thinking that you might be able to talk to it or something. Can we have it? The template report is the next item on the agenda. Oh, the, the new one. Oh so, oh, so wait till the next item. Are you referring to the revised timelines that yes. should, oh, that's for that could Whatever happen. you were going to present, um, with the revised one, 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 we might have some It might be the next. Because we haven't got a quorum. Oh, okay. Yeah. We haven't? We've got Michael, Michael Dacus, Dacus out. Not on anymore. 
So yeah. what can we have a um, quick, quick election for we you could ring somebody to, to make sure they come back on line, but we'll need to adjourn while we do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so is six so, a quorum? Yeah. We've we've got Edward. We hang on. I just had low. We just at, um, eight members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's got two, two online. Well, of course we are, but we're right. So, um, yeah. so we're in core. We're going to adjourn yep. right now. But a solution would be that we call Michael Laws, who said that he could go on his iPad while he's doing his next thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so we be can we some, we can he's, he's actually driving can together we? to get his son. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can go. Well,
already opening the strategy and planning meeting and coloring. I think we will both go on asking yeah, you questions. I was just so trying to tease out what we do with this updated position we've got, which we haven't got, but that will then go to land and water plan tomorrow, and it will happen again because the report for that one won't be at S that one will be at S P, but it won't be the update one, which you'll have the day after. Mm -hmm. It'll happen again if we keep doing this. And it seems to me we can. It isn't a big change, I gather. I mean it just um so if we could talk about that today, it would be good because otherwise we're completely sort of out of step. I was going to say through the chair, mm -hmm. um, that's talking about 7.9. Yes, so, okay. um, so yeah. sorry. And we can wait till 7. Oh, I was going to say, so, sorry, it was, it was my, my, um, my question was, um, are we ready to talk about that if you're past 7.8? Because I'm happy to speak to it. Okay, well, let's okay. wait till 7.9. And my other question on 7.8. Yeah. on 17, is I think that you now have the figures for allocations of the replacement permits for deemed permits and the allocations that were made that we, pre we previously had under them. Could you circulate that round? It's, it's not, it sort of belongs in here, but it, it shouldn't be in the papers, but could you circulate that information to councillors? We, we actually looked into that um, two weeks ago. Um, there is a, a bit of an issue um, with a lot of the consents, um, or sorry, um, a lot of consent applications were prepared um, to replace the permits. Many of them have been um, withdrawn and they're still being um, changed. Uh, to be uh, lodged under the PC7 framework. So we I don't think, I'll look into it again, but I don't think we have received all the replacement applications at this point. But you know the maximum they can, that you know which they are, so you know some of them have fallen off. Um, that we can't know. have a replacement permit we applied for, uh, yeah. consent applied for, and you know the maximum they could be because it's what they currently have operated for. You've given me a figure, and the reason I know about this sort of is that you must have talked to me or somebody did, and I've got on written on the back of an envelope some figures or something, and they might have been interim or temporary or um, whatever figures. Yeah. But we know now, I mean, I could look mm. at the ones that we did have under deemed permits and things and add them all up, and I could look at the ones that we've got applications in for and add them up, and I can know what hasn't got an application and can't and add them up. I mean, I know it would take it, you know, it might take me an hour, um, but that information's sort of there, isn't it? Um, well, yeah, but acknowledging that there's a gap, yeah. we still have a number of applications um, that are being rewritten and we don't know how much they're going to apply for. So we, we wouldn't be able to so say- So that's the maximum that, because so, some of these might be less than that. They can't be more than what we know about. Can I just clarify, we can have a conversation with Richard because this is the work his team does rather than the policy team in terms right. of the consenting. So yeah. um, I'll have a chat with um, Richard Saunders and we can get that information for you. That'll be lovely and just circulate it around so we can get some understanding of that if we could be, because you're about to go out and talk to people about. And you've said here allocation including phasing out over allocation. So it's going to be important sooner or later for us to understand what you mean by that and what how much? Yeah. Whatever. Sorry, Madam um, Chair, what, what report? I know, no, we've got an eight. opportunity here yeah. to talk about the um, approach and timing for future consultation stages. So we have that paper here. 7.8, we're on 7.8. 7.8, yep. yep. So that's your chance. Yep. Thank you. We've got a number of um, recommendations, five of them. And yeah, you've talked about the different um, consultation phases, including phase three. We talked about peer and fighting, which um, throws a bit of a spanner in the works. And that's where we're at. Councillor Malcolm. Uh, so uh, 
you've decided, uh, so staff have decided that the proposed style of engagement from uh, the North Otago FMU stakeholder group is uh, not acceptable to this program. And you've named a few things around reputational risk and speed of delivery and the likes. Yeah. Uh, what consultation process now is available to that group and who will relay that to that group? So um, what we are planning to do is when we consult um, on the region-wide provisions, we will ask uh, the catchment groups within FMUs to initially, um, yeah, uh, nominate one or two representatives for that FMU representing the catchment groups and start the discussions about region-wide region provisions. As we're developing those, um, like I said, there is a strong link with the FMU work. Um, if at all possible, we would like uh, either during consultation two or consultation three, it kind of depends on the timing that we land on, um, to couple onto the FMU consultation, um, further engagement with um, the catchment groups at the same time within that FMU. Um, we haven't really decided um, that it's not appropriate. It would just be our recommendation that it is putting a lot of um, strain on resources. Having gone through the um, Manaharakia reference group meetings, um, it, it is very uh, labor intensive. Often, you know, you, you're there with four staff. This proposal actually goes beyond the Manaharakia reference group because the Manaharakia reference group kind of ceased uh, to execute its role at the point where we started consulting on options. Whereas this goes beyond it, it, it actually involves drafting as well. Um, so it, it's what they're proposing is really a resource intensive. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that, Tom. Um, Council Malcolm, these are just staff recommendations. You don't have to accept no. them um, at all. Council Scott. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to just get across what Tom just sort of said. What, what's going to be intensive? Is it because what I'm looking at here, my understanding is the number three step is over and above. What we're doing, what we're proposed to do in May 2020. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, so I'm just a little bit all over the place, really, because we did have two rounds. Now we've got three rounds. And we're oh, I'm looking at something completely different for one, though. Am I looking at a different report? No, no you're in no, exactly the right place. Yeah. 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 Council of Malcolm's referring to the North Otago um, proposed approach, which oh, we received I see. the on. Um, no, I'm, I'm not yeah. disagreeing with Tom going two, three. No, yeah. I just wanted to yeah. clarify. Yeah. And that adds that. an... Yeah, further. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to hijack the, the North Tiger one either because the North Tiger one you actually came to. The, yeah, that's what it was. It was too intense. Mm. So that's what yeah. you were referring to. Yeah. Not sorry, just too sorry. intense of yeah. a range of different reasons that are yeah. outlined in the report. Okay, yeah. I, I apologize. Yeah. Um, well, I've, can I ask a separate question then? Yes. Away from can. the North Tiger. Well, we're on questions. You can yeah. go. Yeah. So, like, am I doing the wrong thing by supporting the third step where there's this um, era fight and anomaly that's been thrown in there that there's timing issues around? Like, you know, I'm adding to the scope, but then it could be complicating things in terms of December 2023. But I'd like some guidance from staff on that. Um, I'd like to think we've still got a year and a half and just cut your cloth and get on with it. Um, we do have a year and a half, um, but the reality of that is there are a number of procedural hoops that we have to go through before we can notify. We need to um, bring in ELT, um, but also we need to do um, two rounds of um, pre-notification consultation yeah. uh, with specified stakeholders that's specified in the RMA. Yeah. Um, we are also bringing, looping in council and uh, preparing council reports, um, it actually takes up a lot of time. So working backwards from the notification date, we came to the conclusion that actually 
the bulk of the work needs to be finished by April next year in order to meet that deadline. Um, so there's actually not that much time. Mm -hmm. I'd just say, Councillor Scott, it's really important to disentangle the third round of consultation from the peri fight, and they're not they're not connected. The fact that we're doing that extra consultation or reporting back isn't the thing that's causing us issues. It's the MFE's guidance that's causing us issues. So they are separate um, separate things. Okay, well, I'll, I'll accept it on the, on the face of it. But, but the peri may delay the consultation because you need that info before you can go to the community for their thoughts yeah. on a limit, et cetera. Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm now, again, and I apologise, confused because I thought that was the next paper was about the thing that was coming tomorrow, but about peri and things, and you would talk to it then. But I'm now looking at this because I was about to move these recommendations and I see in five that staff will develop options for the timing of rounds two and three for the group at its meeting tomorrow. Why would, so you've got those options available because you've developed them for the nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Why would they not come to us? What's so through, through you, Chair, um, a couple of reasons. One, um, they weren't ready in time for the council meeting, but um, the, the uh, way the governance group is set up is that that's the order. The reason we've brought the governance group forward to tomorrow is so that we can bring the direction they land on to the next SP committee in August. And so we, it, it's, a, it's a timing and a process um, issue for both those. Is that for that. still okay then? Like um, yes, back. if we get direct to the rest, yep. I would, I would like to see they're available today. I realise that they weren't available two weeks ago whenever this paper was written, and it, that wasn't the whole thing's just sort of got out of kilter in a sense. But I would at least like to be able to say, here is the proposal that's going there mm -hmm. in the morning. We note that it is going to be this is what it is. And it's going to be go to that meeting tomorrow because just to say this is saying notes that staff will develop options for something for tomorrow morning and you've already developed them and they're already a bit fair. Why don't we have them in at least? Well, I think we've had the answer to that, haven't we? And we may not agree with the answer to that, but it's in relation to the order. And um, okay, as I'd far like... as staff are aware, that's the correct order that we want to go with. What should say the more governance group, s &P, and then council, yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to move the first four, and I'm not going to pick up five at all, because I think that's a nonsense. Staff will develop options for something that they've already developed options for, we're just not being shared with. So I'm just going to ask to move the first four. Through you, Chair, everyone does have those options because everyone's got the governance group agenda for tomorrow. So you've, you've all got that and seen it. Right, okay. So can we refer to it now, here? So it can be in part of the public record for this meeting. Um, I think that's the same question coming from a different angle of what's the correct timing or not. No, yeah. because I'm saying if we've got it and it's there, this is the public meeting, this is our public face time, then why don't that agenda, why don't we just say as per this agenda when it yeah. says no. With respect, you have asked the same yeah. question approximately yeah. 10 times. Philip. Okay. And what, what's the approximate hmm. answer? No. Or yes, or it doesn't suit us to do it in that order, or that's not the order that was sorted, or what? There isn't a motion or anything to do something different. I have it? just said, I would, in view of that, I would like to move the first four and note that as according to the attached agenda for the meeting tomorrow, this is what it will be. Oh. It's just sort of... So that's it. Here is where to, where to talk about things like, because 
Okay. And through you, Chair, my understanding was that these matters were to go to the governance group first, and the governance group is not, and um, we don't have the same representatives. For example, we don't have Murahiku here today, and then they would um, direct anything to go through to SP as required and or council. So that's the order that we're trying to preserve. Um, but it, it, whether you want to do something different, that's, that's that your case, call. Um, that's just the order that the start that the council agreed on when they set up the governance group. When they're presented to LMP tomorrow, <laughs> LWP tomorrow, do they make the decision? No. So those options no, so that they pre so presented through, tomorrow, what happens to those options? So they would make a recommendation and we would bring a paper to SMP in August. And it won't, be decided. it won't be decided. It won't be decided. It won't have been done. They don't have... Oh, okay. Oh, you got an answer. So they don't have decision-making okay. power. No, no, that's fine. If, if those options that are being presented tomorrow, um, nothing happens with them, they just look at them and talk to them tomorrow. They do the normal come, process. Yeah. What's yeah. that? They do the normal process. The, the governance group comes to a uh, conclusion, passes a recommendation off to the next SP meeting in August. Just the way it always works. Tom. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the reason why they're not included or not described in this paper is because the agenda needed to be out at a certain date. And we literally developed the options uh, on, on Monday, we, we settled on them. And then we send them out with the governance group agenda, which you all have. I feel very reluctant to kind of mm -hmm. have an in-depth discussion about them now because we've got a technical problem um, and the science team is working on two options to tackle that. The options are reliant on either of those options working. And I'm not in a position, and I think nobody from the policy team is in a position to kind of say which option from a technical perspective is likely to work. Um, so tomorrow at the governance group meeting, we've got Tom there, Tom Dyer, and he'll probably, because the thing, his thinking is developing as well. And he's, one of the options is for example, we use Southland data. Um, he will be in a better position, hopefully tomorrow mm -hmm. to kind of say whether that's a viable option or not. So, so we've identified this an issue. Yeah. So yeah. we'll talk about we, that issue yeah. here and we've thrashed that out publicly Could we, so people can see there's an issue. We are thrashing around that issue in land and water governance group. We will, between now, at, well, governance group and the next SMP committee, we'll have a lot better direction for the public. At this point, I oh, guess the answer is it's not going to be too much I've got an answer for benefit to the community. <laughs> if we throw something in here at this if, point. If we change the in this resolution to saying that staff have developed options for the timing and we'll present these to the governance group at its meeting tomorrow and a recommendation will come from them back to the next S&P meeting. Right. Yep. Is, that, is that actually what's, what's happening? Yep. And what what's happening? Yeah. How's yep. that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Any other questions then? In which case I'll move those. Yeah. All right. We've got five recommendations that have been moved. Yeah, I'm still going to move. Or shadow in addition to those motions. Rightio, yep. Moving secondary and additional. Yep. So I'll just pick those up. Because that's what I need. We might. Be happy to just take yours on, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, I think she can take okay. that on. I think, I think, um, everyone will be happy. Everyone will be happy, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a look at what I've got to say. Have we moved? I don't know about this one. Yeah, I think it's smaller, so I put it up. So, which one's coming? That's coming out, that one. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And then, so is it noting that staff have? Or, yeah, it's a yeah. noting. Was that yes. the normal staff. process? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then that's. I'm happy to add. 
Kevin's motion as such. If you want it added to the above ones, Kevin. Well, all it's saying is that uh, CE, the chair, and the deputy chair are going to go and meet with that group yeah. to, to make sure uh, to, to basically sit there. We've, we've told them we've got the time frame we're restricted to. Yeah. We've told them uh, here's the post that we're doing. How can we fit you into that program? Which okay. they, which, which, they, which they come, and they understand, they understand when this process came forward, and, and this letter came forward. Uh, was it a May? I suppose. And I, and I was before that. Yeah, and, and April. So it would taken quite a while, but a lot of them understand what's happening. Yeah. Speaking to that at the moment, Kevin. Hey. Hey, speaking to that. I, at the I, look, I am actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, this is uh, you'll see on I think it was item thirty four mm -hmm. about the approach that we have had from the FM North Otago FMU stakeholder group uh, that requested a, an alternative way of consultation, an alternative uh, engagement process. We are uh, simply saying in light of the staff recommendations and the time constraints and, and where we're at with the process that we, uh, that I'm seeking the, and have talked to them, uh, the chair and the CE meet with this group uh, to go over exactly what said the engagement process that we have and to arrange that they are involved in that so the best way we can get them involved uh, with the process so um council stock cool um i you know I, I missed out on a little bit of that previous debate on that um us I, I mean when i read this staff report one of the things that jumped out to me was described the consultation process that only relies on engagement with selected stakeholders does not meet the principles of the LGA or the process requirements of the NPSFM. Now I may have completely missed something here so I'm not trying to live storm. Um, that's on page. I mean is what's being proposed, my question quite simply is, I think what Kevin's saying is it'll meet the time requirements, the same bar 2023, it'll fill in the fat, but does it actually meet the requirements uh, to establish, you know, for the FMU, for the... No, no, it's just for that group. We're actually not Sorry. in questions at this point. We're in a debate and we've got a recommendation. We've got a paper that actually does a cost benefit, a risk of yeah, us. Right, order. Well, the thing is we've introduced this new topic in a... Well, actually, it's not a new topic. Isn't it? mm, it's not. The paper covers this one. Yep. Are you either speaking to it or you're not? Yep. You've got a chance to speak to it if you want. Okay, like. well, I, it's, it's, I'm not asking a question, but if somebody could just tell me it makes the requirements <laughs> of, the, of the water plant uh, prices, well, even well, in North Otago. I really appreciate that. They, they could lift their eyelid or something. <laughs> Um, right, I'll allow it this time, but Doesn't you did actually points. already cover this one off Tom earlier uh, on. Through you, Madam Chair, if we do this, we have to complement it with an, a full FMU process, uh, sorry, a process that allows everyone in the community, and that is anywhere in New Zealand, to participate. So you cannot just rely on the alternative process. So you have to combine it with another process. In North Otago, we're just talking about North Otago. North Otago, yes. So you've, you've got the process, but you have to make it New Zealand wide, which is slightly different than the other well, FMUs. Um, the NPS requires you that you've got to engage with communities in Tangata Finua. With communities means everyone. Yeah. And are you okay with that? Is staff okay with that? Well, that's what we're doing in the FMU process. It's open to everyone. Yeah. yeah. I think the key thing is that the approach that the North Otago group are looking for is far more extensive in terms of time and resources than the proposal that staff have put in. Yeah. Um, and as I said to Councillor Malcolm before, you don't have to accept our recommendation, but um, but um, and, and there's probably a solution in there somewhere. So the, the, the motion as I see it will enable us to figure out if there is yeah. Some, uh, yeah. some something that works um, yep. For North Otago yep. in the timeframes, as opposed to adopting the approach they've set out, because we've set out the reasons why that doesn't 
work within the timeline. So that's my understanding. Pretty good. It's I'd like to talk to it. If that's yeah. talking yeah. to it, Tilly. You're welcome to talk to it. And my talking to it is that I think it all works. Um, I am pleased about six, which has the chief executive in it, and he will certainly not allow us to try and do anything that would not work for our staff or take us down a rabbit hole that would be inappropriate. So that will, between him and our chair and deputy chair, they'll be able to come up with something that with our able staff in the background, telling them what will work and what won't work, will be a good way of moving forward. So I'm liking, particularly liking six and the, and the other things are all good to me yeah. now that I understand completely what's going on here. So I recommend that to the rest of my council colleagues. Okay, I'd like to speak to it if that's all right as well. If everyone else, you've already spoken, Councillor Scott. Um, I strongly recommend against doing it, and I know that sounds sad, but we need to back our process or not. Uh, we've had that opportunity through the paper. Um, I back our process. Um, sure, I'm the FMU councillor for the Tyree. We've got some very significant issues in the Tyree, um, a long <laughs> history of working with community there. I'm certain that we would want to do a more intensive process there as well, definitely. Um, I don't think it's fair to um, focus on one particular area. Um, I honestly think that if we set ourselves 10 years to do this water plan, that wouldn't be enough time. If we took an intensive approach with each catchment, imagine it, <laughs> one year of intensive process with uh, the Tyree, one year with the Upper Clutha, one with the Pomahaka, one with North Otago, it, we would not get there in time in 10 years if we took that type of approach. I know that we've got down there that we're going to come up with something that is suitable to the community. We either have to back our own processes or we don't. And I'm sorry, but I'm, I, I, I do back it and I want fairness across all of our communities. Thank you. Awesome. Madam Chair, I have to go. I cannot stay any longer, but I, I, I equally am concerned with um, recommendation six. Uh, very much, I could go on quite a long time about it, but it's very much what caused us to come up with the LWP governance group as a result of the money we had to care stuff going on there. Look, I think it's a rabbit hole of massive potential right, proportions. So I'm sorry I have to go. I've got another function I've got to get to to do a do a welcome. Sorry. Is Ed, Ed, Edward oh, our quorum? Oh, he is part of the yeah. quorum. If he is our quorum, then if he's gone, if he's going, we either vote quickly before he goes or we mm. don't vote and put right. it on the table or move to him. Uh, we've got another paper after this one as well. So he's mm. gone, we're finished. He's gone. Yeah, he's gone. I'll um, save my right to reply to you re-adjourn the meeting because um, we'll need to re-adjourn the meeting still. tomorrow morning, I think. Before what is it? Eight thirty? Do we start at nine? Otherwise, I think nine o'clock is our schedule. Mm. We've got two meetings tomorrow, haven't we? One on onslaught, the other one's on something else. It's yeah, still recording, yeah. aren't we? So yes, we need to make a decision so, on that and move and second it. Yeah. We're going to have to because we haven't got people here. So we're going to have to adjourn and come back at 8.30 tomorrow morning is the proposal. I can move. Sorry? Yeah, I'm moving it. You can second it. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thanks.